call the meeting to order. Uh, first on the agenda is reception of guests. Michael, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm Mike Rushman. I'm from Cabot, Vermont, uh, and I've been working with the owners of the Brooklyn Mall for the last two and a half years on the various initiatives that you may have heard about, the transformation of a 65-acre parcel into more of a town center, mixed-use, pedestrian-oriented project, and we've been working closely with the town over that period of time. Some of the things that have happened as a result were the big art, little art uh, uh, exhibit that we had, Walk the Long Trail at Berlin Mall. We'll be starting that for the third year here in January, uh, and the recently announced um, 100 unit senior housing project that will be built uh, on excess property at the mall adjacent to uh, Walmart. And I invited Michael to come and, and speak to us in very general terms about different things that the, the mall uh, property owners may be interested uh, with respect to land that borders the school property. Um, and also, you know, things that may have, be of mutual benefit for the school or for the town. Um, and so we won't get into any specifics, but just to have that um, general discussion. Um, and we can look at when we have that under, let's look at 1.2, agenda review and revisions. Um, I'd like to add like a three. Last. Um, I just want to talk about the board meeting schedule going forward and what we have for thinking about future board meetings and uh, with my head being in what's been in for the past week it's I came with the decision today literally that I wanted to have this discussion with every local board okay all right all right no objections we'll add that as 3.6 any other revisions to the agenda are you gonna move up the mall so piece? that would be my, my next suggestion yeah. would be we can move up the, okay. the discussion about the mall property uh, for our guest who is here and that's number 3.5 but we'll take that up uh, we can take that up next so like I had said um, this was just to have a, a general discussion about some of the things that were are being considered with respect to the mall property um, Michael did you have a map, yes. perhaps, that we could look at while yeah. we have this yeah. conversation. That uh, only two because I updated software yeah. today, which seemed to leave me with an inoperable printer after I finished. <laughs> okay, so to you and Carl and to, or to Bill and Carl to share. Okay, I think Carl, you've seen this. So, do you want me to sort of describe what's on? Yeah, if you could this. describe what's on the map and what we're looking at here. All right, uh, as I mentioned, the mall has a 65 acre parcel. And back in the early 80s, when the Act 250 per permit was first given, there were several so-called out parcels that were created. Uh, most of those out parcels have been dormant for the ensuing 30 plus years. Uh, recently, a couple of those were combined and became the site of the Kohl's uh, department store. Mm -hmm. Another one of them, uh, out lot B, uh, which is that little triangle just below the garden center uh, of Walmart, is where the uh, senior housing project will be. Uh, and then there are two others, outlots A and C, on that map where it says two plus acre hotel residential restaurant site underneath that label, so right in there. Now, that's if, right. if yeah, you that's see on that diagram, there's the roughly 10 acre, it's called oftentimes the uh, uh, town forest parcel or whatever, but it's, it's really, as you know, uh, portion of the holdings for the Berlin Elementary mm -hmm. School. Uh, and it is a effectively landlocked parcel because the only road frontage it has is on Route 62, and it's literally impossible to get additional curb cuts on Route 62. If you look at that green dotted line that's there, that's the approximate boundary line between the school parcel and a fairly thin strip of land that runs along the mall access road. So the mall there has a thin strip of land that has all kinds of road frontage, but it has no depth to it. So one of the things you do as a developer, my background is law and planning and development, is you try to look for situations whereby combining things a little bit differently or whatever, you can try to create value or create opportunities. So something that um, occurred to me a couple years ago, actually, and I've worked off and on uh, since then, is whether there would be an opportunity with the mall 
and possibly the town in some kind of a role and the school board, or can you create a development pattern <coughs> that would be uh, appropriate for multifamily housing, uh, potentially affordable for multifamily housing, uh, that would both benefit the school district in terms of creating some value to a, a portion of a piece of land now that has no real development value, but maybe more importantly would increase the uh, student base uh, for the school uh, and with students that would be literally able to walk the school uh, on a trail system through the, the woods without ever crossing a road. Um, I have had some discussions with third parties. The mall owner itself is not a residential developer. We're not developing the senior housing project. It's a Vermont developer that we located and are uh, doing joint venture with. Uh, and I've had discussions with other third-party Vermont-based uh, developers that I think would have an interest in a development pad for multifamily housing there. Uh, and so this was something that I brought up with both the past chair of the school board and with, with Chris. And, uh, and I know with Act 46, you're facing you know, sort of a, a deadline in terms of a, a change in status. Uh, and so there may be a, 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 maybe a logical time uh, to look at whether there's something here that uh, could be a, a benefit for all parties concerned. So that's basically where it is now. It's at the talking stages, uh, and uh, we're happy to cooperate in some fashion. There's a more complicated version of this that unfortunately involves yet another third party that, that I don't control uh, and uh, that potentially could lead to the school ending up with additional land immediately behind the playing fields that you have now that would allow for expanded playing fields. Uh, so that's sort of a uh, plan A, plan B, if you will. But as a yes, back it back, that's basically mall. just north north of the words, approximately. So Mike, that's that's mall property, but there's a third party who has an interest in it yes. as well. So it's not something that the mall unilaterally can do by itself. And that goes all the way out to the pain turnpike. Mm -hmm. So the first one that I described is something that could be done simply between uh, the, the school and the mall owners. Uh, the the one that would involve yep. the playing field would require at least this out-of-state third party to sign off on it in some fashion. And that one probably would be more likely maybe to have a town role uh, in it uh, as well, that maybe those playing fields would be some kind of a cooperative venture between the school and, and the town. So what in the conversation that I had, I conversations I've had with Mike and um, and recently with the town, I would, you know, our our interest I think is in some multifamily development if that's a possibility to help improve our school population, um, and also in improving our rec fields if there's any way that we can can do that. Um, those were the two big things that I brought up, but I wanted to have the um, board and superintendent and, and principal uh, weigh in. Um, on just some some of the general um, general ideas behind this and what we would be looking to um, get out of some sort of uh, deal involving the mall owners and the town. And, and maybe if I gave a couple numbers, it would help with the scale of what we're talking about here. Pending actually getting out there and doing a survey on the property that would be involved. A lot of that property, as you know, is class two wetlands, and so that obviously can't be touched. There's a buffer back from that. So it's basically a, a strip that would be parallel to the entry road. Uh, so it would be sort of a, a long, narrow kind of a building as opposed to a more square building. I think we could potentially be talking about 50 to 60 units of multifamily housing, which would be meaning two to three bedroom units. And if you think of one and a half to two children probably per unit, you could be talking about 70 five to uh, 120 uh, students coming from literally that one project. Now they all wouldn't be school age, but most of them would be. So it's, it could be a pretty significant addition to the school age population. Are you looking at low income or uh, residency, like partnering with? 
it, it's I, I'd rather not get into because no deal has been struck with anybody. It could be anything from affordable, which right. are all kinds of definition from right. low income. Yeah, you, have to have a ratio. you have to have a ratio. Yeah, a lot of the focus now is on workforce housing, which yeah. is sort of 80 percent to 150 yeah. percent of median income. And then another model that works well in Vermont, and I've worked for Housing Vermont back in my first stint in Vermont, but is a mixed income project where some of the units are affordable right. and meet those standards, and other, then other units are, yep. are market rate units. So it's early stages of those discussions, and there's more than one developer that I've been talking to. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, someplace along that spectrum yep. would be what we That's fair. About. Now, did I understand you to say there are two? proposed residential developments? One right now. Or two locations for proposed residential development. Well, the one that's been proposed and that, that a private developer is going to move forward on is a roughly 100 unit senior housing project. It's everything from independent living, assisted living, and memory care all under one roof. Uh, meals provided, three meals a day for the assisted and, and memory care units, one meal a day for the independent. Uh, so it's a it's both a residential project and an operating business, if you will. Both the assisted living and the memory care are licensed by the state. The, the independent living, of course, doesn't need to be licensed. That's on that little piece next to the garden center at Walmart. Did this it, separate uh, one that I'm talking about goes all the way out to Payne Turnpike. Pardon me? The, the piece that goes all the way out to Payne Turnpike. No, no. That, that doesn't. Immediately adjacent. Immediately adjacent, exactly. So as you come in the entry road, and just as you get to Walmart, you can turn and go around behind the wall. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right there, there's sort of a knoll, which would be graded down, but right, right there. The second development opportunity, the one that I'm talking about, would be along the entry road. As you came into the mall, it would be on your left, and it would be parallel mm -hmm. to the road there. And that yellow, uh, excuse me, orange area with the orange dotted line does not impinge on the wetland? That's correct. That's my rough... Uh, Approximation again, not going out there with the wetlands consulted, but looking at the wetlands maps that the state has, knowing what the buffer is, etc. So that's just, you know, it's more than eyeballing it, but it's it's a, just an approximation at this point of where I think the development path would be. You have but a faint orange line uh, just to the east of the school parking lot. Is that a wetland delineation, or is that a subdivision within uh, school on property? D? Or maybe I'm seeing things. Parallel to the dotted green line? It's way over. The, yeah. the orange yeah. lines that are on here are parcel lines, but they aren't. They're from tax maps, and they're on you know a state database. Mm -hmm. They aren't completely accurate, and that's why I dropped that little green line in, because I have a survey, of course, of the mall property, and that green line is very close to where the actual property mm -hmm. line is as opposed to that orange line that is, well, I don't know, 50 or 75 feet to the left of it on that sheet that you're looking at. Okay, so there, am I, maybe it's just the photocopy, so there is no orange line just to the east of the parking lot? That's not a... No, that's just, that's the printer okay. leaking. Yeah, right. no, that's, that's the no, no, no. property <laughs> line ostensibly okay. for the okay. school. I didn't see it, but... With my eyes, but this is right. more this accurately is sharp and lots of light. So, you know, what the nub of this is, is both the school and the mall owner in that area have pieces of property that they really can't do anything with. And at the moment, neither by itself has any value. But if they cooperate and put their two pieces together, there is a development opportunity, and maybe more importantly, there's an opportunity for multifamily housing to be built there. You brought up the uh, the opportunity, uh, essentially created by Act 46, um, and the schedule for Act 46 is maybe uh, uh, may determine what we can do here. Right. Um, so you're aware of that? Yes. Yeah. Living in Cabot, I'm all too well yeah. aware of that. So I, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know who's going to be on the new board, Peter, but um, not me. I don't think. <laughs> thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I don't see this as a huge. I mean, the board's going to want the new board would want to have some issue in it, but I also think they would look at you know what does this board think of it and support that. I, I well, I'd like to positive. think that. I just don't. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, 
I'm right where Chris, the advantage that you saw, Chris, you know, kids and a way of maybe supporting and getting more playing fields. Uh, those are those both are great things that we need. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm more than willing to, I would want to think about it and see it, yeah. see it through. I'd want to talk to our council um, down at, in Scott Cameron's office and just say, what do you see? What do you, I've talked to him about timeline for property transfers and all that. So I think it's something that will get into that new board, but I don't think it stops us from talking about these things right now either. So no, it's a good place for it to start. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're certainly aware that you've got all kinds of, you know, issues that you've got to address as part of this that are more central to the educational mission. And so, you know, we're here ready to help out however we can participate in whatever discussions make sense to you when that makes sense. There are also some pieces of this that have to do with a town center designation. Uh, uh, yes, something that we started on two and a half years ago is yeah. there's a state program uh, that allows the state to designate new town centers, uh, which is sort of akin to their designated downtowns and BSFP village centers. Mm -hmm. There are only two that have been done in the state, one in South Burlington, one in Colchester. And we approached uh, the town, um, meaning the mall owners, about this two and a half years ago when I started working with them. We had several meetings with the state. They were encouraging, but there were things in the town's town plan and zoning ordinance that needed to be updated to incorporate some statutory language. Mm -hmm. The town plan, as you know, was, was readopted a new one in August, and the zoning is up for a new zoning ordinance in, in March. Assuming that that goes forward, we'll we, when I say we, I've been sort of dispatched by the mall owner to help the town with the application. And so Tom Podelsky and Dana Hadley and I meet every couple of weeks on this now. Uh, and we'll be are preparing to file an application for that uh, in, um, in March or April of next year. And that basically increases the town's priority for certain funding uh, uh, programs that there are from the state may make a TIF district easier. Uh, if you're a developer and are trying to do residential, particularly affordable residential, it makes the development process simpler, including the Act 250 process. Uh, and generally signals to the regulatory bodies uh, that the state believes that development and the location uh, makes sense. Uh, we're, we've met with uh, Chris, and one of the things we're hoping to do is incorporate the school district property and the fire department property into that. It could be up to 125 acres um, uh, because one of the things you have to show is public facilities either are in the town center or if there's a plan that they will be located, relocated to the town center over time. So so to clarify, the town plan was updated to to meet your yes yeah no it was all required yeah it was it and had then, to be done for all kinds of other reasons right. but as part but at of that, that time we yes, did that. Yes. And the zoning still needs to be done, but it's headed in that direction? Yes, in fact, they were well along in the zoning and then sort of put that on the back burner because the deadline came up for, under the state law, that the town plan had to, you know, be revisited and, and, and updated. So, yes, the zoning, I think just in the last week, the Planning Commission took its final action, and I believe the public hearing now is maybe the 20th of December. Great so. time for hearing. The other, <laughs> yeah. the other thing is that the fire department land belongs to the school okay that that's, came, that's that, a lease okay that's that long, came up the long other term day. Lease. Okay. Okay. so that's another issue you're gonna have to look at uh, yeah yeah it's yeah. It, it's again just having uh, uses like that in the town center are some of the boxes that we have to check off on this application i don't think that's a deal breaker in any respect i mean it's right. beneficial to everyone to oh, have yeah. it no, no, no. there yeah. right. um which was the the intent when it when it happened um the but other, it's a long-term lease i think it's a 99-year lease the other thing about the strip of land that goes all the way out to pay turnpike is it potentially provides either a secondary means of ingress to the school or actually a different primary means of ingress to the school further away from the stoplight uh you guys are even, you know, certainly well aware of how that traffic can back up there uh, now. So, all right. Well, I thought the time was ripe to bring this to the to the whole board. Um, we've Absolutely. expressed interest. I think it's important for the town and for the mall developer to know that we are interested and open to further discussion on this. So I, I think we have that from 
our discussions here. Are there any other questions for, for Michael? Okay. Thank you for the time tonight and Thank for the interest that, that the two chairs have shown before on this, and hopefully something works out that everybody's happy with. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome to stay. We have an exciting agenda. <laughs> uh, I told my wife I'd take her out for dinner. She just <laughs> finished her hair. Ah, well, priorities, I guess. Okay, I'll leave those Thank you. With, with you if you That's want. That's great. Thank you for that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, any, any further discussion on that one? And Bill, hopefully you made a note on the fire department thing. That's something that I just learned Just about. learned that from Peter, too. That's yeah. one of the things that... It's one of many things I'll be talking. You saw some of this on Friday. I'm going to be covering some of the things on that. Okay. It's good. That's why I asked for that extra piece of agenda. Okay. Just as a footnote to that, we talked about institutional memory yeah. last week. Um, that was designated as police and fire. Okay. And the police and fire had a falling out, so they never, <laughs> never got into the things school. like that. Never. Happened. But we thought that would be really good yeah. adjacent to the school. I think it is too. It's actually yeah. a great place. It's, it makes. Our only school that has an evacuation place that's by foot. And it was far better than the alternative, which probably would have been McDonald's. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. It's not said, I guess. All right. Uh, let's go back up now to 1.3 public comments and correspondence. Any, any public comments or correspondence anyone wants to address? All right. 1.4 future meetings. We have our January 14th meeting here. Uh, February 20th, carousel meeting at U32. Um, and then I'll also note, that is it January 9th, Bill, is the organization? Yeah, that is going to go through all of that, Chris. I brought I brought a, a, one of my handouts I gave was an updated timeline from Friday okay. to today. We'll cover There's that. A, I actually put a couple more things on there than were on there on Friday. Okay. Things are becoming clearer, well, somewhat clearer Clear as the days go by. All right. 2.1, the uh, approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to take a look at the minutes? And uh, if so, I'll entertain a motion. Yeah. I would move to approve the minutes as presented. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. No, I wasn't here for that. All right. <laughs> Any revisions to the minutes? Then all those in favor of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Carl abstaining, he was not here. Mm -hmm. And the motion carries, the minutes are approved. 3.0 discussion agenda, 3.1 budget draft number two. Bill? So before we go into the actual budget draft that was in your packet on page five, I wanted to give you some contextual information, which I handed out tonight. Um, one of the things that you've seen every year, and it was in your packet, but I brought you a legal one that's a little bit bigger, not much bigger, of what it's called, the we use this as the budget final budget analysis from this current school year by budget functions. That's what goes down on the left hand most column so you have the function areas of the budget and we're able to look at this across schools and everything that's up top we start to look at enrollment um, square footage of buildings or meals per day number of child children that receive I, IEP services and enrollment pre-k so th those are all kind of some demographic data and as you look at this information um, you'll be able to see that across the schools, but specifically you have Berlin, where it has a Berlin name, that top of that column. The next column to the right, down below under the budget categories, is the percentage of the overall budget. And the next one to the right is the cost per equalized pupil. So you'll see that, for example, Berlin's expenditure budget for this year is $3.5 million dollars which results in a $17,801 per equalized pupil. Is there, I don't know, if from, Peter, you have, we've had this for a couple of years, but we need to put a really bold line by the callus, the callus to the left of the callus column, where it says callus. Mm -hmm. That's all Berlin information there. Everything over here. Yep. So anything that's colored yellow means it's a low compared to all six schools. And if it's green, it's high. 
And some of the things this year, because of the way we're assessing them across schools, especially superintendent and special education assessments, we didn't even rank them green or yellow because they're done by equalized pupils. Sometimes the green is good and sometimes the green is bad. And same for yellow. It's just a way of asking questions. It's to help refine, this sheet is to refine your questions, not necessarily you want all yellow or you want all green. It's just a way of saying, how do I kind of look at what's happening for services at our, and cost per budget? Peter, especially, but I'll say to Chris and Carl, because you've seen this other years, slow me down if I'm going too fast. Mm -hmm. I give this to you as information. Down at the bottom, you'll see other statistical information. A lot of it's operation by plant or special education costs, where you'll see what we divide it by. For operation of plant, whether it's capital fund or debt and capital and operation of plant, we do that by square footage of the building. And then where you see the food services, it's the support per day, per meal. And then this pre-K is cost per pre-K enrollment. So it's just divided by the pre-K students. The other green line corresponds with the other green one up above. Huh? Yep. Um, the special education cost per SPED student is divided by the, the number of SPED students that you had up above. And the student transportation is per equalized pupil. I'm not, that there's not much of a variability. I mean, it's less than $20. $21 from the cost of Doty to the cost here in Berlin. Um, so sometimes the range isn't that great. It's not worth looking at the greens and yellows. Sometimes there's a big range. So you kind of have to look into the numbers as well. And then way over at the right, we try to give it to you by the super, the whole supervisory union. So if you the furthest right column way over, you'll see that. And you can see what the costs are by the supervisory union. So this is this year's current budget. So I expected people to ask me what's it look like for next year. So you'll see an eight and a half by 11 that I gave you that has something that looks like this right here, where I took some key figures for the budget for this current year's budget. That's the top table. And the bottom table is draft one all draft ones, and U32 is already in draft two, and you're getting your draft two tonight. All the draft one budgets for this, for FY20. So that's what the bottom is. And this is where you have some tax rate information there as well. So again, you'll see that we have the total expense budget. Each have offsetting revenues. Those are revenues that get you down to what's the local, what's called the local education spending. This is what gets you your tax rate. On the top table, the bottom table, you'll see equalized pupils again. And then on the bottom table, you'll see a differential of what's happening in equalized pupils for this year. For Berlin, we went down eight students. Uh, sorry, where's that line? I'm on the bottom. I'm on the fifth one down, Chris, where it says EP e change. EP change. Equalized pupil change. Yep, see it? Minus yep. eight. Got it. And then you have your local spending per equalized pupil. So in this current budget you have in front of you is $18,117, where last year it was 16892 Okay. What's the big jump there? Uh, well, equalized pupils and an increase on your overall, your increase in your budget, which is mainly HR. Because we the, the stuff that was below the line that Aaron wanted to talk about tonight is not in draft one. Okay. okay? And then you see a calculation above and below the threshold for spending where you get into the penalty zone. And for every dollar over that you need to raise in taxes over the penalty threshold, you have to raise two for the one that you need. So you, this, in the black means that Berlin's three hundred and seven thousand dollars away from the penalty threshold in overall budget expenditure. Away as in above. Uh, you're below. below. You're below it. You're below that threshold. Black is good. Okay. If you go to Callus, you'll see they're nine thousand dollars above mm -hmm. the penalty threshold for spending. EMES you see is fifty two one hundred and fifty two thousand below. Romney's one hundred and three thousand above. Doty's 29,000 above, U32 is 211. 
overall, the whole district is 520. When you do those pluses and minuses, the district's $528,000. No matter what our governance is going to be, whether we merged or not, next year, the entire Washington Central Supervisory Union would be over the threshold in spending, all districts, whether we were one or six separate. You mean on the FY21 budget? In the FY21 budget, we would be. Okay, that's our forecasting. That's with a, sorry, I forgot to add this caveat. That would be with a level funded budget, not level service, level funded, where we know health care and salaries are probably going to go up. Um, so then what you see down below is if the next line is if there's any penalty for excess spending. The town tax rate with CLA from last year, if there is an emerge. Okay, so for Berlin, that's $1.69.4. If it were merged with CLA from last year, and under what's ordered, actually, let me say the next line up. The merge equalized, education equalized tax rate, if it were one district right now in these first draft budgets, would be $1.79. You see how it's blank all the way over to the district? Mm -hmm. So then we said, what would it be if we applied CLA, because different towns have different CLAs, what would be the merge tax rate? And then we have the change, draft one, to the, so we are, we're looking at last year's tax rate to a merge tax rate. You can see the changes this year. So an increase of 5.4 cents for Berlin, an increase of 3.1 for Callis, a decrease for East Montpelier of 3 cents, a decrease for Middlesex of 11 cents, Doty, four tenths of a cent increase. So I've heard a lot of different numbers, Bill. This yep. doesn't doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> not, <laughs> not that it should. Not that I have any great understanding of it. I thought you know the things that I've heard most frequently are, you know, East Montpelier's taxes are going to go down. Uh, the towns without debt, their taxes are going to go up. How does that how does that mesh with this here? Well, because you're looking at. People were only talking about debt that were doing that, Chris. You have to look at overall ed spending. And our debt is not the majority of our education spending. Yeah. It's very tiny. So therefore, it's really based on how much you spend per equalized pupil. Look at the equalized pupil spendings for each town yeah. in their budgets right now. That's what drives taxes. So the, the numbers that hit me when I saw this chart, uh, this one, not, not the one you just gave, is um, East Montpelier has a few more students than, than Berlin, yep. yet uh, originally over 450000 more in, in overall education spending. And that isn't debt, but it certainly is cost per pupil that's going to be distributed throughout the newly merged district. Yep. And, and, I, and it struck me that that's a lot more than the, I mean, their debt payment for their $10 million bond is probably two or 300000 a year, right? I'm, it's, I'm about, it's about five hundred and ninety dollars now. Okay. Well, it's coming down each year, maybe yeah. five sixty. I'd have to go look at it. I was going to say that that $400,000 difference means probably more. And let me tell you what changes the district it. than yeah. their, their debt does. And what changes it faster for them is not their expenditure change, but the change in equalized pupils. Mm -hmm. You ask, why did it jump so much for Berlin? That eight pupil difference decrease, remember, that's the divisor. Yeah. And you're under 200, so you changed your pupils by 4%. Yeah. Which so I'm still, still looking at those numbers that you're talking about, Carl. So in the, in the green and yellow sheet you handed right. out, the per pupil spending for East Montpelier is 20,600. And here we are at 17,800. And that's this current budget year. Yeah. So go to next year. Go to the sheet I gave you, the other one that has all the numbers on. Not that one. All right? Yeah. So now go look at local ed spending per equalized pupil. Yeah. And ours is going, we're, we're jumping there. Yeah. And remember this. the major, We have over than 50% of our students are at U32, whether I look at the town of Berlin or the whole supervisory yeah. union. That union has that equalized per pupil. So what it does, 
and this is what it does that you know when we if we look at the overall tax rate right if you've got 50 about 50 percent of you you're already equalizing your i should use a different word you're leveling your tax rate a little bit between the five towns because you've got over half your students being educated at U32 under that cost per pupil of $18,921. Yeah. So the, with that there already, and we know that we have more than 50% of our kids there across the SU and in Berlin, there's only one town that doesn't have 50%, greater than 50%, that's Middlesex right now. They you you already have some uh, softening might be the best I, I'm not sure what the right average I, I'm trying not to use equalizing but we have some yeah. equalizing of the rate the tax rates yeah. and so you have tax rates in Vermont are not driven they're driven by spending per equal local ed spending per equalized pupil mm -hmm. that's the way tax rates are done End of the day, to sum it up in a less confusing way, though, uh, East Montpelier is certainly gaining an advantage. Um, How about Middlesex, Carl? They have a higher cost per pupil. They're at, they're above the threshold spending, and they're getting eleven cents down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it's hard to make sense of. Well, it's because of that they the last year decided to spend right up to the threshold. Yep. This year they have a hundred and three thousand. If they were in their own district, if they're not, they're below the threshold because the whole SU can be below the threshold. You know, I don't know if it's the per one of the unforeseen consequences but as a as a board member and a Berlin parent and a Berlin community member the thing to do for our community and our students is to jack spending and I'm not advocating this because this frustrates me I'm not advocating it but the thing to do was to have more improvements when it was time for our bond and a bigger bond and more spending right now because if we got up to that threshold level, we might have two extra FTEs here at Berlin that are going to be paid for and distributed throughout the SU. And that would, that would provide school-wide improvement and a better education for the children of Berlin. It, it's sad that it, maybe that's the purpose of the law. I don't know. Maybe it was a purpose I never saw that it puts you in situations where... It allows you to ask this question and ask to one board, how do you want to use your resources? So is equity, if East Montpelier students are at a higher proficiency rate, taking some of that $400,000 that they decided as a community to spend um, for maybe and, and giving those two extra teachers to... It's a good question for the new board. Equity. It's what should be asked about the new board is, where do you want to put your resources I, I just finished, uh, Chris, I think has heard this from me, I finished, just finished writing a paper about rural superintendent leadership and that one of the most powerful things for causing student improvement is putting your resources for, to where the kids that, for the kids that need it and where the school performance is. Which is right here. Right now, yeah. Hmm. Couple of math coaches. And that's what Aaron has in the budget. I mean, he's not putting it in. I want to talk about it. So that gives you some big, I wanted you to have some big yep. context because I know people are going to be asking this. I mean, this is going to go to, these budgets are going to go to the transition board and then the new board. So I said, Miles will start putting together something like this. Um, so in the new, we kept the budget the same. Um, we have been able to, um, figure out the from draft one to draft two we've gotten uh, more precise on staff turnover changes and on uh, money that we put in the budget for anticipated movement across the index so if someone's getting another degree we've been able to put that in here with that all said 
the net impact on taxes. And I'd be glad to go through each of these lines. I'm not going so fast that you don't you don't have time to ask questions. We also are sure of the Washington Central assessments. So those are exact numbers now. They last time they were estimated three percent. So the total for that is an increase of ninety four thousand six hundred and twenty eight dollars to the budget from FY nineteen this current year or a 2.7% increase. Um, and there, the, the, there really haven't been any changes up there. What Aaron wanted to be, and he wanted to be here tonight, and I'd be glad to try to call him and get on a cell phone, on a speakerphone, wanted to talk to you about a couple of things that are happening um, that we, we anticipate. And so I can go down through those, and then if we want to do some sure. detail calling. Yeah. Yeah. So we anticipate, we think there's a retirement coming. We don't have it in hand. So we wanted to let you know that that's about a $16,000 increase. Uh, we have one teacher here on a one-year. So if we replace it with that one, that teacher is here on a one-year contract. Because we have another teacher, you may remember from last year, Michelle Turcott took a year leave of absence to go do some work and be with her family for a year. Um, we're also in P anticipating that about 0.2 of our, t our school-wide program funding is going to get cut, 0.2 of an FTE, which is about $24,000. Federal grants are going down. Um, there's some instructional support and programs, books and supplies. The Aaron initially came to us with about 15000 but we were able to find money from this year's budget that there's about 8000 in one-time costs for things that don't happen every year. But there's some things in the here in the library and in the guidance materials that should be put in annually, and that's about 7000 And then he did add an extra math interventionist. This assumes that that point two, that we get point two in funding through a different way of consolidated federal grants, um, but that we have an extra math interventionist coach, interventionist, I'm sorry, at 76,000. And we're seeing a real uptick in our pre-K population. We could open up a third section of pre-K. We have so many kids that in town. Here. Yeah, in Berlin, which is great. That looks good for future population. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. Um, as you all know, our kindergarten was really light this year coming in, but it, we could have a sec we could have a third section right now, and we definitely see that going into next year. Is that all Berlin pre-K? All Berlin pre-K coming. Through? Yeah, all Berlin. We've usually had like one or two that comes from another town, but we we could have with what we're seeing in child find and what we're being told about uh, for folks that are interested for next year between basically this year's three-year-olds and this year's two-year-olds. It would be our three and four-year-olds for next year we could have three sections. I will tell you that also the student need in the pre-K is going up in the supports they need. So this is- What does is, that mean generally? The that means that going? students that, that will need services, whether it's IEP, 504, we see that happening. And that's, that's just a continuation. I'm just telling you it's getting greater. I've been telling you every year it's getting greater. What mm -hmm. we're seeing from the uh, societal issues is just, we just, it gets earlier and earlier. Um, we're seeing that as well. So we wanted to bring you all those price tags. We weren't expecting, you know, all that, but to say these are the things we've been thinking about. These are the things we were talking about. Aaron and I had this conversation. We thought it was good to have this conversation with the board. His priority is we kind of put him in a priority level there um, of of things. The seventh, although the seven thousand is small in the third, but we tried to rank that in a prioritization piece. Um, because we we just we see that stuff coming. All right. And um, can you speak to this bill, or should we try to get Aaron on the line about the need for the math interventionist? Yeah, I mean, we've been saying in the supervisory union and here that math is, needs to be our primary focus. 
Um, we'd like to have Kim for own. Some of it's our class structure with the multi grades. We teach math in a singular grade, so Kim's been doing some of that. The reason to take point two of her out of the grant is so she can do more of that and be more flexible. Um, but we also need to have the math interventions for students at a younger grade so we can get kids back onto track more quickly. Um, I know they're not serving, and I don't have the actual numbers, Aaron probably would, uh, all the kids they could serve with Kim Frone's time by herself um, for math interventions. So it's, it's supporting the straight grade math teaching and taking 2.2 out of Kim's current position that's funded by grants gives us that flexibility because the grants won't allow her to be a classroom teacher. She can do interventions and coaching. And then the other part would, um, we'd have the other person focus on interventions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of what Carl was saying earlier. If we had a math, uh, a, another math interventionist, we can provide more of those supports earlier on for kids. And we're kind of having to make some <laughs> tough choices in that. It's not that they're not getting interventions, it's just, it's. It's easier to provide more with more folks at the, the helm. I think I'm stating an obvious piece, but and I'd be glad to give them a call. So let me see if I can get them. It's hard to disagree with that. I mean, having heard it from Aaron and at U32 as well. So would that be, I'm trying to I'm trying to catch back up here, would that be a fourth interventionist? Two? That would be two yeah. literacy and two yeah. math. And we are, I mean, our literacy scores are, are starting to turn, as you saw back in the October, uh, the October meeting. Hey, Aaron, it's Bill. Hey, how's it going? Good. I've got you on speakerphone. I'm here with Peter, Chris, and Carl. Hey, everybody. Hi, Aaron. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. I've introduced the budget and the budget considerations down at the bottom, but I, we were talking about the additional 1.0 uh, math interventionists. And I was wondering if you could give some more details about uh, the, you know, the data that you're using and the sourcing of that, why you see that and what that will gain us. Sure, absolutely. And uh, first, I apologize for not being there tonight. Um, yeah, I've uh, obviously taken a lot of consideration into, you know, what I'd be proposing. And um, back in October when uh, I presented the, um, the October update, um, having not only looked at the data, but just just being a new set of eyes, being a, your new principal, and and really kind of seeing um, what what the needs are. I mean, I think we've all seen that um, the data is showing that we're struggling in math. Um, one of the things that I I also recognized strictly for Berlin is is you know just some of these scheduling pieces and and the structure of um, of positions and scheduling and, and you know how how we're providing not just intervention but but, but classroom that that tier one um, uh, tier one service and looking at um, Kim Farrell's position she was when I came on board uh, looking like she was stretched pretty thin not only doing some trying to do some classroom instruction, but also the intervention piece, which in my opinion, you know, we have two reading interventionists, which is great. Um, and we have a, you know, one additional math interventionist slash regular ed funded classroom teacher, and it just wasn't working. We, we, we made some schedule changes um, for her to help with some tier one, and I recognize that with those needed changes, we were uh, even more lacking with uh, math intervention. So, um, considering that, we are. I'm. I'm. I'm hoping we might make some changes with King's position 
uh, which has impacted the budget, and, and knowing that that will reduce some of her intervention time, and seeing that we have a tremendous need for for, for mass um, instruction and support for kids, that, uh, that I was hoping that we might look at some additional intervention support and really kind of make the whole system of Tier 1 and, and Tier 2 really work, really work well. So I hope that gives some insight into into the, the uh, thought and reasoning. Um, it definitely comes down to the data. You know, it's, it's the area that we're struggling in, in the most. So in my opinion, we wanted to put some resources where the data is showing that uh, we need it. Thank you, Aaron. Any questions for Aaron? No, thank you. I think that confirms what you told us previously and what we heard at U32 recently. Hope we can do it. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions about other items that are there on the bottom for Aaron? He, uh, Aaron, I talked about you know trying to free up Kim at that point too, and then that we yeah. anticipated retirement, and if that were to happen, that's what the staffing changes were. And then I explained the pre-K section that we're just seeing a lot more kids uh, that we could do a third pre-K section. Yeah, I I can talk to any of that if you want me to. Why don't you give a couple? Why don't you give a couple a paragraph to each? How about that? Sure, sure. So um, yeah, the pre-K piece. Um, um, I've met with pre-K teachers. Um, Katie and, and Beth, and uh, we started to meet with Kelly Bushy just because we were seeing a um, an increase in students coming into pre-K with with high high needs, um, special education needs, and right now the, the ratio is much higher. Well, let me back up. It's, it's higher than um, you know in terms of more special ed needs. And quote unquote regular ed, and uh, just seeing that we have um, a lot of services in place, and knowing that we have a few students that are you know, on a waiting list, and um, just seeing that it just it seems kind of like year up here, just throughout our education, there's more and more need for 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 pre K. Um, so we've been kind of brainstorming how how could we possibly support kids. Uh, and still kind of work within some of the parameters of, of, of room space, of you know, potential staffing, um, and uh, kind of putting our heads together. We even met with, with, with Jen as well, Jen Miller, and um, kind of felt a balance might be to propose another half half day session that is that is school based. Um, so that was some of the reasoning for that. Um, and though I forget the other two things you mentioned, I think you mentioned the retirement. Yep, I did that one. So that one's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then, no, in terms of, yeah, go ahead. Um, and then the instructional support programs, books and supplies. You want to just give a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So there was a little bit of a, of a, of a um, an increase, and in what I've what I've recognized in talking to staff. This this fall, I mean, back in October, I did some, uh, some, some, um, had some conversation with the teachers, and uh, there's a few, there's a few things that that have been um, kind of neglected. So one one area is is uh, some of the some of the music instruments. Um, Kate and I have been, you know, kind of piecemealing some things together. Um, and uh, just having, going over some of the, the actual instruments that we have in the, in the band room, um, we're, we're, we're just getting by with a couple of, like the big bass drum is, is pretty shot. Uh, the snare drums are, are not in great shape. Um, so there was a little bit of an increase for that. And the other, I guess, bigger ticket item, if you will, is, is some of our science materials. So this past fall, we also, cleaned out the attic or the uh, second floor of, of the school and uh, some people just did a great job of, of going through everything and um, we were sorting through the, some of the science materials and uh, they don't, you know, they're sold, they don't match our, 
what we're expected to teach at, at the different grade levels with, with the new next generation science standard. So there was a little bit of an increase just for the third and fourth to start with in, in that area. Um, and uh, we had also talked about looking at some guidance support and uh, we were not able to just pull some of that off this year, but that was another um, part of the supply line that was that was uh, um, suggested. Yeah. Great. Any questions for Aaron? No, oh, but I think um, while he's on the line, maybe um, trying to understand what what are the consequences if we don't add another pre-K section. Did you hear that, Aaron? Yeah, consequences if we don't add another pre-K. I think um, I think we were trying to balance su supporting kids, you know, supporting Berlin kids that are coming into into school at that level. You know, obviously, we can limit we can limit it to what we have. Um, we have. Uh, some days we have we have quite a few adults in that pre-K room only because we have like OT needs or, or speech needs. You know, we have a couple kids that require a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, some uh, severely handicapped kiddos. So, you know, and we're also required to not only have the teacher but a regular, regular, a regular, a pair of educator through regular ed uh, in there as well. So the days we have quite a few adults, we have a lot of. Um, a lot of uh, kids with needs coming on, on 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 those days, so I guess it would just kind of still be, you know, we we service these kids. It would, um, I think, another philosophy is to try to not have a pre-K with a lot of kids with high needs. I think more the philosophy is to try to balance with um, regular ed, if you will, students, just to try to bring some level of of I don't know normal normalcy to the atmosphere, I guess. So it's just trying to kind of create what is a good scenario for, for kids at that age. Yeah, I, 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 I've done the actual just pure number calculation. If you think about the Act 170, 166 vouchers, nine is the place. If you have nine kids in a classroom, if it, and I, yeah. I'm not talking about educational outcomes. I'm talking just finances here. It's more cost effective to have the classroom at nine, below nine. Yeah. The vouchers are more effective, and that's yeah. without looking yeah. at it from an educational yeah. outcome piece, but just a dollar and cent piece. Right. Well, the educational outcome piece is, I guess, kind of where we are trying to find that balance. Um, right now, we're licensed for 15 kids in a in a session, and we're at 15 each. <laughs> So it's, uh, you know, we're at max right now, and like I said, some, some on a waiting list. And even if, as, as we're kind of projecting into next year, you know, same same thing, you know, full. Um, we do have, obviously, a few kids that are going on to kindergarten that would be, you know, that have needs. But um, just seeing, I um, um, was, was just at a meeting last week at the family center of a, of a new kiddo coming coming in, um, turning, turning three soon, or four. And... Uh, yeah, no, I agree with your educational outcome analysis, Aaron, 100. percent I just wanted it so the board understood the numbers yeah. when you look at it from a number, a budgetary piece. Yeah. So we have 30. 30. Currently. Yep. Yeah. And we, we have some on waiting list after that. Do you remember how many are on the waiting list, Aaron? Um, it was around five. But see, what happens is some people will just they don't want to be on the waiting list, and they'll try to find something else. So these are people that. I mean, the you know, waiting list is is uh, um, pretty few and far between that we have kids leaving, and then we call somebody on the waiting list. I don't, I'm not sure if it's even happened this year. So, you know, sometimes they say, "Well, there's a waiting list," and people don't even bother wanting to be on the waiting list. But it's 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 like five kids that are that are on the waiting list, from, from my recollection. And there's some indication that there will be more yeah. next year? Yeah, what, yes. And what we do look at, and Aaron, tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, as you said, there's other kids that we always get seem to get a few more kids that come into kindergarten that didn't even go through our pre-K system, which I'd like to get everybody okay. in, or even, you know, just yeah. to let us know they're here. 
Um, so we always have a couple of those, and we have, you know, from what I remember Kelly telling me, Aaron, and you may have told this to me too, but we think the two-year-old numbers are as high as our four-year-olds, if not higher. Yeah. Yeah, I looked back, uh, one of the things I did find was the, um, uh, in the, the last couple of annual r- reports, um, I know it's not exactly accurate, but just, you know, the births in Berlin, they always kind of tell you how many kids there. And I think the 16 and 17, maybe it was 15 and 16, uh, lists are, are, are a good size. <laughs> I don't remember how many exactly, but uh, uh, they're there. <laughs> and the percentage of students in these classes with special needs may go up next year? Well, that's what Aaron was just telling you about, of family he was at just the past week that he was in a meeting that way. That's a, those are our trends. I don't have hard data on that, Peter, but uh, you know, we're seeing that needs of students are still going up and it's getting younger and younger. Yeah, yeah. definitely. definitely. <clears throat> I'm just gonna use the word trend. The trend seems to be that happening, um, not, not really you know, slowing down, if you will. Do we have a cost for a third session? So we do, right, that 45000 okay. We put a second session into Calis. It costs us because you have to have a teacher and a paraeducator for 15 kids. You have to have two adults there the whole time. And to put that second, put that second session in this, this calendar year, because this happened after the budget at Calis and they used fund balance this year to cover, it was 45000 So I said, let's just put down 45000 We know that that's in the ballpark to do it. You said a teacher and a paraeducator for 15. If, right. If we had a third session, we might have fewer. We might have fewer, but it, you have to you have to have two adults in the room at all times. Okay. It's a pre-K standard. Excuse me. You can't have you can't you can't just have it one adult. Okay. Well, three nines is 27, and we're already at 30, right? Anything else for Aaron? Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate you being accommodating for me today. No problem. I understand. Well, I'll talk to you tomorrow, Aaron. All right. Bye. Great. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So, you looking for some direction from us tonight? Yes, Bill? I am. So we're looking at a 7.5%. That's if we took increase. everything there, it would, be seven, everything there. It would be 7.5, which I understand that that's really high. <laughs> I, 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 Lori put it down there and showed me the sheet in the first draft, the first you know, draft of this report. I'm like, I don't like that number, Lori. Yeah. She goes, well, you said to, you and Aaron said to price all these things out. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, I guess we did tell you that. So so those are there. I, I you know, I'll tell you, I. And I'm not saying this to devalue any of them. I didn't expect to get all that, but I wanted to kind of bring a menu of our thinking, um, our thinking towards resources for kids, um, and to know what we're trying to, what Aaron's really trying to lead the school through and talking about how can we better support kids in Berlin. If it is a trend, that's something that will have to be considered for years to come. And that's the way it works. It typically, it's a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I must have missed it. Can you help me understand again why this, the retirement results in a cost for us? Yeah. I can explain that to you. So. Um, without trying to put out too much information on the staff member in public session. You could have a staff member that has a lower education level, although they have many years, they'll, they'll, they'll tap out on the... Okay. Uh, we have a staircase for different levels of education for how many years that you keep getting increases if you looked mm-hmm. at the salary index, mm-hmm. and there may be a differential in benefits. So you're anticipating a higher at $15,000? I'm anticipating to replace that person. We've been very pleased and now I am pulling out a staff member in public meeting but of our person that's a one-year replacement right now so that's what that cost is 
you could tell me to re-advertise and rerun and give me yep. a top level for that. Gotcha. For that. That's how you have a specific number. Okay. Yep. I've been in her classroom once. Aaron's been in her classroom a lot. That's hey, he's doing an awesome job of getting out to people's classrooms and giving feedback, yeah. and he's, he's really here. yeah he's he's all over the place. He's doing a great job. And so that's you said these are in order of priority. Yeah, that somewhat. and try yes because we really think if we can free up Kim out of some grant funding, mm -hmm. we can give her more flexibility to do her job based on what's coming up. When, when she doesn't have that flexibility because the grant restricts what she can do, it just ties her hands and Aaron's hands with the building. If, if you did that but said, we're not going to give you a math interventionist, it doesn't mean we might be able to use that other grant funding some other way to help interventions around here. I just don't know the answer to that right today. Because it, trying to hire someone for point two is really hard to do, especially an intervention. They, they can pretty much choose where they want to work in this state. The jobs are out there. Yep. So. And we're we're looking at this budget under the assumption that this is a recommendation to the new board. To the transition board, which the then we'll recommend. That's why I want to talk about the dates. At the, at the end here of tonight, of like what's on our agenda for us at, for the Berlin board, yep. and how much more work we do here, because the transition board is going to start working on January 9th. Right. Are fund balances available to us for any of these items? They could be, they could be, but just remember you're making a double hole a year down the road. Yeah. Because if it, if it's operational, something you might. Fund, I'm just going to use easy numbers here. If something was ten thousand dollars in operation, you took it out of fund balance. In two years, it'll be a twenty dollar, twenty thousand dollar hole. Yeah. So I get that. Well, in the case of early ed, it's uh, if, if it's a trend, that would definitely happen. Yeah. It's not a one-time yeah. occurrence. Are, are we uh, able to limit the numbers of students in pre-K? We do right now because of the waiting list. Because we have to stop at 15 students. Can we students. limit it below 15? You can. I wouldn't suggest it. I don't think it really does Obviously, different for some learning. Rationale for I wouldn't suggest it. I think, I think that they're limited at 15 for the top. That's what they're licensed for. Mm -hmm. And remind me, Bill, there's not a revenue side to pre-K. There's not at all. Get anything from the state. We get our point four two for our, for our, towards our equalized pupil. Yeah. But that's what we get. Yeah. Remember, it it's one of the things, and I've been guilty of encouraging this. So to think of revenues and expenditures, but really our equalized tax, we get all the money we set the, that adopted by the voters for the budget. Mm -hmm. The state then turns around and says your taxes is this or this because you, yep. your spending per equalized pupil is that. Yep. So let me be naive here for a minute. The, the state has mandated pre-K, is that? That's correct. And, but they, and they do fund us? Do they fund us to the extent of K through 6? No, no, point it's point point four two of a of that of, of, that, of an equalized student, and I, based I, on some formula that they came up with. Yeah, how about the uh, special ed? So component? we don't get special ed components for pre K. Pre -K. We don't get any wow. su educational support for special education for pre K, where we do get reimbursement in our other in our other grades. Yeah. yeah. Carl? Uh, I'm still kind of catching up on the budget here, but uh, I know, I, again, I'm torn. I feel like um, Berlin's fiscal responsibility is, is coming back to bite us, but also I don't want to uh, uh, you know, add 
an obscene amount to the budget that gets voted down when something potentially happens where the merge is delayed or there's potential for um, uh, better circumstances for the merge. So. Act 46 is, is clouding my vision on this, <laughs> is what I'm saying. It's hard not to have that happen. <laughs> yep. I totally understand. It'd be easy to say, well, we'll pay for it out of the fund balance, and, but don't worry about it. You know, mm -hmm. A year from now, but. <clears throat> uh, let me ask you this, Bill. Uh, in other elementary schools in the district, do they all have pre-K? Everybody has pre-K. We have one section at Doty. With how many in them? Uh, Fifteen. And they've wrapped around with all-day care, just as you have here. Berlin and Doty and East Montpelier are the three schools that have been able to do. Oh, no, Cal's has two. So they've been able to do that. Are there any with nine or ten? Mm -hmm. That if we merge... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I, I have to tell you, we actually... in. Cal's, we have one or two students coming in from other towns. East Montpelier, we have three or four, but they could, they have enough on a waiting list now. They kind of wish that hadn't happened. Um, Romney is full. They have a waiting list, and they have two sections. So. Geographically speaking, uh, merging doesn't help Berlin because we're almost an island. Twenty. 20 minutes away from the nearest uh, elementary school, I think, is you know, East Montpelier is a solid 20 minutes. I think that's probably the closest. It's probably the closest. Yeah. So. Uh, so it would be tough for us to share students away from Berlin or yeah, to Berlin. I think the only way that I think you would get parents I, happen to be going. I know this that you would. There are parents. Whether they're from our five towns, Montpelier, Barry, South, to our West, that are working in this area, they're asking us for pre-K openings because they'll bring their kids. Yeah. You know, if they get wrap around care, to go to work yeah. and use it as yeah. pre-K and daycare, yeah. and that's one. Of the, I mean, it's one of the things that um, has taken me a while to get the respect that we have for a district that we're able to provide these wraparound services with, you know, we own community connections and with CC and that work to say, we can give you a full day package, parents. And I think that's why we're getting so many people, frankly. Yeah. Well, I'll just say, I think I can, I can very easily support the first three. It's the, the bigger spends on the yeah. interventionists and the um, pre-K section that are giving me heartburn. Um, without, those, <laughs> without those, we're somewhere around 4% okay. um, net increase there. Uh, so with, you know, they are another 3.5% or so to add those in. Um, I'm with Carl in that if it's a, if it's a, <laughs> this just does not feel fiscally responsible to say this, but if it's a Berlin budget, I'm worried that it won't pass at, at that amount. If it's a, a district-wide budget, I, I think it's got a better shot, and I'm not as worried about it. You know what? I think maybe you just answered our question. I said, from my perspective, I think the Berlin budget is what we're looking to present. I, I would say we don't include those two, and, but for our transition representatives, we recommend that they be put in the budget for that exact reason. Berlin, would, Berlin's all. budget would not pass with those in it. Yeah. And uh, the transition budget will be um, so big and hard to decipher and <laughs> and uh, with so little community ability to have oversight that it, it might slip through. Is that not how it's going to work, though, Bill? Are you going to get, you're going to take whatever school, you know, the Berlin budget, the Romney budget, the McAllis budget, and just roll them together this first that's time. What the, that's what the executive committee told me to do And, and so back those, in August. So the transition board will then take a look at this as well and could make some. They could make changes. Okay. But then you're, you're you know, one-sixth of a board arguing 
for an increase over what the Berlin board <laughs> has already asked for. Well, that's what's going to happen from now on anyway. Yep. Yeah. I think you, you know, the transition members, whoever they may be, will have, if they feel comfortable, they'll have to bring that recommendation and for that and with the exact explanation of why. As a transition member, would that be a difficult case to make? I think so. You think it would be difficult for you to make? Yes. To say I, I have one spending decision when I'm sitting in this chair, and then you know when we all get together, I'm going to say, well, since we're all sharing this, I want to spend more. Everybody, I, I think, will say that, and we'll have to have that <clears throat> moment. I think you're going. I think it's. I actually think it's going to be a good discussion. Because I think it should be this discussion, and this is what I've always felt for the seven years. And I'm not saying it because I'm pro merger. I, I know I've been very public with that, but Berlin Elementary School has not had the resources it needs to tackle the problem of where the student performance is. And so, because of that, we've been we were able to put our money. We did it first with PBIS, and we saw our our behavior improve in the school. And we, we went through some ups and downs on that, but we, we've been able to really weather that with that work. And then we went into literacy saying, we're going to put two literacy interventions in. And while the SBAC data is changing a little bit, the local literacy data is changing a lot. And that's usually how they stagger. The, locals will, the local assessments will change faster than the state assessment. It will come up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's about, it's back to what I said earlier about what research is showing is putting the resources behind where you're trying to make the improvement. And that's looking across the SU and I look at scores. When you look across the SU at scores, is there, do you see a correlation between per pupil spending and scores? No, I see a better correlation between free and reduced lunch and Sorry, scores. Between? Students at risk and scores. And so Berlin with the highest free highest. and reduced lunch. Yeah. And the highest one of the higher IEP counts. So is, is more staff or more spending the answer? There? More staff. More staff. Which is more spending. Which, Which is, is more spending. spending. But I think that is a, a case that would appropriately be made in the new structure by whomever our representatives are without, almost, yeah. without pause. I mean, it shouldn't be uh, awkward or difficult. It might be difficult um, simply because if someone, if the new board is truly looking at the entire consolidated district, Success came they should came be able well. to recognize that uh, exactly what Bill has just described, that, that Berlin has made progress where we could uh, and our, our current needs are X and Y and this is how we can justify them. And the fact that we can't today justify that percentage of increase uh, to, and in, in order to expect a, a, a vote to pass um, is legitimate, I think. Because there, there should be another table that's with this, and may, maybe I'll go make it to, you know, the next week. I, I thought about it today, I just didn't have time to do it, which is, let me put student results up here. And what's that tell you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying to make like a dashboard for board members, nothing more than an eight and a half by 11. Mm -hmm. But that's just a dash, you know, just kind of like where's, we can get you all the details and give you a lot more numbers, but how can I give you a dashboard so you kind of understand yeah. those relationships? <clears throat> Another option could be, I suppose, special articles. Can we do special articles um, for the, the two components that we're currently saying we are, are wary of? You could. Um, I think in, e in either governance model, you could. I mean, that's another way to do it, and it requires then an explanation to whatever voters may show up at an informational mm -hmm. or town meeting um, in you know, a, brief, a brief description, probably in an article, but at least identifies uh, what you've identified as, as the needs of the current Berlin Elementary School. Or we can just say, you know, we can't, this is our limit, 
and take it to the next yeah. interim board. I guess that's what I would suggest is that we in, uh, do the budget with those first three lines included, um, and I can take direction as a member of the transition board that we would have this been a discussion among the full new consolidated board, we would have include, included lines four and five as well. I think another justification is that uh, the last time we had a 6% increase, our budget failed. Mm -hmm. Granted, it was largely due to the, the bond, yep. but I think it was 6% plus the 8% from the bond, yep. as I recall. It was 14. So, so yeah. if uh, that, ma that magic number was 6, 7 would certainly be yeah. difficult to attain approval for. I, if you're all, if you think you've got it, Chris, as a board, then okay. I'm, got I've got that written down. I have what I need. Thank you okay. very much. Peter? First three items, reluctantly no one was last two. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for all that information. Uh, board member vacancy update. I don't think we have one. I don't, I don't believe I advertised in the last, in the, I was going to do, do it on Front Porch Forum since our last meeting. I don't think I did that. Um, I had done it the month before with no takers. I'll, uh, I'll try, I try I to ask, do that I again. I had a couple of people I was thinking about speaking with, mm -hmm. and the thought occurred to me, why would anyone in their right mind <laughs> well, <laughs> get on the board at this point? I keep trying to pitch it as exciting times. Why, why, why would anyone in their right mind? <laughs> so well, <laughs> he, he, he has a lot more perspective than most other people. Well, there's something about the right-mindedness of that individual. Well. <laughs> well, that, that, that could be said of any of us. Yeah, I think no, it, it, if it was, it would need to be somebody that had board experience. So. Yeah, Rather than advertising, I think the right way to go would be to Straight attempt up. to find a former board member that wants to serve two to three meetings. Actually, well, it depends how many meetings you want, but you, we need to be able to go to December 2019. And we need to be able to go, we definitely have to go till June 30th, and there'll be need one meeting after there before December 2019 to accept the audit. The audit. So it, one of the things that I am a little worried about is quorums, and I was going to bring that up some more in this board meeting yep. schedule and all that. Yep. Do you say regular meetings until? Well, the that's what you, you can decide. No, you can decide. Well, it might be easier to get a quorum if if there's really nothing for us to do to say, okay, we have a. We have board orders. Board orders. Board orders, and if there were ever need a student Stop hearing. in for that. Yeah. So yeah. board orders are monthly? They are monthly. You do have a motion that gets you, so you don't have to do them monthly. Okay. Um, I know some places, as they were in this merge, they went to bi-monthly or quarterly. I wouldn't suggest quarterly, but um, and w this gets more into that meeting schedule piece of okay. we. I need I need to make sure we have a board majority, otherwise the select board needs to appoint to get to a majority, um, as I understand it, so that we can keep the board this board has operations right through of all this fiscal year which the reason why there's a meeting after June 30th is to accept the audit yeah. yes I imagine that's gonna happen in some towns maybe maybe not you 32 we have the situation where if everyone if no one ran we'd be um, we would have a minority board where there wasn't a majority of the seven and, seats, and I have to look this up myself. But the vacancy process for school board is if it's within the if it's with a district within the town, it's the select board. I remember calling yeah. at one point, uh, yeah. or having someone call Krista or Michelle call yeah. your office. Yeah, and the thought was we didn't press hard, and they said you really want us to go yeah. after this. And, and I think there's a provision in there that I, I never imagined would be used. But I think if there's nobody available, then the Secretary of State actually <laughs> has some role. You might be able to figure that out. Oh, I'll check it out. Do you want to? Do you want to go to that, Bill? Sure. What um, What I wanted to do was to start to talk about. Um, I have one of those. If you want. So, um, I enjoy being with all of you. My time is getting crunched more and more with nights, and and Chris has heard this at the executive committee. But I'm going to start really having to decide where I show up. Um, so it doesn't mean you can't have board meetings, and Aaron can service you as, as staff the meeting. Um, I didn't know, once I believe that the transition board will probably 
need to meet almost weekly, if not every two weeks. Um, I'm trying to do it on Wednesday nights. Um, I, I could be wrong. It, we could go very fast, but in Washington Central, we tend to like to talk things a lot. So uh, I'm anticipating that we'll have that. Um, there are three things for them to do, and then the new board will probably meet um, two times a month plus some subcommittees. I'm going to suggest this to transition board. They recommend to the new board you think about at least a finance, a facilities, and a school quality standing committee. Okay. Um, Can so I just ask Bill on the transition yeah. board. Is there such a? There's not any provision for alternates. There, there is a provision. If the clerk and the chair don't want to serve, the board can name. I mean, standing alternate. There hasn't been one that I've seen. Because I'm, you, you my get busy. will be tight, and yeah. Vera has just not come tonight because she's overwhelmed with so many meetings. Right. So it'd be nice if we could do alternates, but I don't think the law. Provides I don't think the law provides for it, from what I saw. Um, so what I wanted to do was say I, uh, I handed you this schedule right here. You all have a copy of it. It's literally the reason it says draft because I keep changing it every day. Yep. Um, the organizational meeting, as you saw in the warnings on January 9th, uh, there's a typo on here around first. Uh, like I said, it's draft. The first transition board will be that same night after the district meeting, probably for organization. We figured out on Friday with the articles of agreement that January 19th, we have to post for the new articles, articles of vote. People are going to vote on them. There would be a hearing on the 14th, and I bet the transition board will want to meet after that hearing at some point to say, where are you with the articles? Um, even though the articles subcommittee may want to meet as well, but I think I wanted to reserve a board meeting then. Um, the petitions for the new board and for the local board to continue or do by January 28th. I got that confirmed today from town clerks. Uh, they usually like to have them before then. They like to have them around the 21st. Um, and then there's the article vote for the, the, the electorate vote from all five towns on the article is gonna, it's gonna be February 19th. Uh, I left the 90 days in there. Town meeting is on March 4th. Um, I was looking at today to have a new board meeting somewhere around March 13th. I figured the day after the election was probably a little quick, so I had to go to the next Wednesday. Um, and then trying to get to a budget vote for a merge district, we're looking at April 30th right now, which would mean a warning would have to go up between the 22nd and the 31st. I know some other districts that are in, uh, in forced mergers are looking like the 7th of May or the 14th is the latest, but if it were to be voted down, we want to be able to come back for a second vote. So I, the secretary's off, the agency of education is suggesting get it done no later than May 1st. I think they're trying to get people into that April 30th day because uh, since Tuesday's generally our traditional election day. I'm trying to keep with that tradition of Tuesdays. So the town meeting Town meeting day vote will be on both boards, the existing, existing board, board and, and the merge board. board. Yep. I, I actually today set a meeting just so you're aware of, I've got, we got in touch with all the town clerks and we're meeting next week yep. to really like clarify yep. all these different parts and yep. pieces and, you know, does the Board of Civil Authority need to be there for all three and I, I think these are things that are going to go to... Yep. To may hit your office. It's definitely going to hit our attorney who does our municipal pieces and just say, let's make sure we have all these figured out and get everything in alignment. It was actually Rosemary's great suggestion this morning. She said, Bill, I think we all need to come together. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, I think that sounds like a great idea. Let's do that. <laughs> so when she said that to me about 830, we said, let's put this together. I will keep adding to this timeline, and I will be sending out via email as there are significant updates. Um, so all of you are in the know of just kind of what the calendar is. Yep. And I said on Friday, and I started doing it today, is prepping a screen, uh, an online video that I'm doing mainly for the staff, but can be used in the community as well. Just kind of, here's the process, here are the timelines. I won't know, I would say, I, I definitely don't know anything, but if you don't ask me the question, I can't go try to find it out. So if you have questions, please let me know. Just jot in an email to me. I'll be glad to try to find it. 
her answer. Donna Russo Savage has been phenomenal. Every time I send her a question, she's back to me within an hour or two. And sometimes that hour, it's like, I don't know yet, but we're working on a draft of that, and we'll get you that. She must be on it full time. Yeah, she is. So, so you, you said at a town meeting, the there will be two votes, one for the merged, and one, one for, for the existing? For the existing, whoever's terms are up. Terms are up. To continue, well, for just those individuals that will become members of the merge board? No, it's to continue the, the local board, board needs to continue, continue through, year. through to June, to December 30th, 2019. Really, we need for the, for the board orders, we need through June 30th. Yeah. But yeah. we're going to need another meeting after that to accept the audit. And the way the uh, articles were written was if the audit comes after June third after December thirtieth, two thousand nineteen, the new board can accept it. But we'd rather have the existing local board accept it. Well, it just occurs to me that perhaps we should have a full board if it's possible to have one just to be available to whatever assist yeah. Yeah. the interim board members. So Vera is the only person who's term runs beyond town meeting day oh oh really so hers does run right I, I'm okay. quite, oh right because yeah because there's there's chris yeah right so yeah right vacancies right well i guess under those circumstances i would continue um if if none of us run <laughs> can <laughs> that's another thing to look up is who makes the vacancy appointments. Well, that's why I said it. my interpretation, and it, well, I wasn't talking with you, Chris, but yeah. someone from your office was the select board. It was the select board does until they get to, they make just enough to get to it so you have a majority. Yeah. And then let them take it from there. Okay. Okay. Is that a possibility? Yeah. I don't see anyone else. Yeah, it's a possibility. <laughs> I don't want it to be me, let's say that. How about that? I don't blame you. I think it needs to be a public body that does it. <laughs> or an electorate. So that was my piece, and you can scratch okay. off the three six. I, I'd like you to think about it. I am thinking right now, unless you ask for it to come back, and I'm going to work through Chris on this, that um, you know, we'll be glad to sh we'll share you a budget with the updates you gave us, but that in January we don't need a lot of input on budget from the Berlin board. Am I in the right place? I think so. Okay. I think we've had all the input we'll, <laughs> we'll give on that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we're in, under the Act 46 section. Um, communication building. Is there something in particular? No, I don't remember that. I, 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 I know I, that you put I put out the front on. porch forum out from yep. the, when we were working on Friday. I plan to put up the video and send it to staff, but I'm going to send it to you. And if, if one of you says, hey, that would be great to throw out in the Berlin. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have it have a slant, but I'm going to also say if there are anyone else out there looking at this who's not a staff member but would like more information and look at this as an informational piece, I, I literally kind of made the skeleton of the PowerPoint today. So I'm hoping to get it filmed tomorrow or Wednesday at the latest. Okay. And does this board have any opinion on, you know, something that should come from the board chair, any sort of things that ought to be communicated to the community? Kind of in an official capacity, I guess, from the, from the board. I don't think it's our, our job to, to necessarily advocate. And I appreciate, Bill, although you're obviously a... Um, a supporter of merger, that uh, your communication was uh, factual and impartial and, and wasn't a, a push piece, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, know th I know the community I serve, <laughs> and it's okay. It's okay for me to have my own professional opinion, but I serve the community, mm -hmm. so thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I think there is some need, and it may or may not be our responsibility, but to inform the voters or, or, or at least attempt to bring them up to speed before they vote on something because it make the chances of a successful vote that much greater. Um, how, are, how we do that uh, is 
is, is, uh, is a big question in my mind. Uh, I hate to dump it all on you, Chris, but um, are you finding this the case in other towns, Bill, that, that the uh, committee members and so forth and board members are, are interested in having some kind of informational feedback to the voters? Um, I can say that most of uh, the three or four superintendents that are in the force merger, as we are here, that I've talked to, um, and I'll talk to more this week, um, have sent out pieces to their town already or have used the media to do that, mm -hmm. just to say, this is where we're at. You know, basically kind of, we're figuring it out, we'll get you more as we can, kind of what I've been doing with you. Right. But now I want to get it out more than that. Um, and what went out in that front porch forum. And... I don't, I know of one other community right now that, that's trying to get different articles going than the draft articles that are coming from the state board. That doesn't mean there aren't more than one other, but I only know of one other that's trying to write and go for a vote before town meeting day for articles. I think as much as anything, I've heard this at the, at the debt committee level of just a, a concern that somehow or other all this Act 46 information get transmitted to the voters or, or summarized and transmitted or in some way um, inform the voters prior to town meeting day, let's say, uh, just so they have some uh, inkling of what's, what's going on. I mean, obviously some people have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Some people have been studying it for years and some have, are, are, are totally unaware of exactly what the ramifications are. But, you know, the questions that will come up at town meeting are, uh, why are our taxes going up? Um, you know, how is this going to work for our children? Uh, maybe not in that order, hopefully not in that order. But, um, um, and, you know, what about, what, you know, debt committee? Why is, why are the, why are we absorbing debt from other towns, essentially? Um, and, you know, there are, Justifications or rationalizations or reasons for those mm -hmm. changes, and uh, if there's some way that we could we could uh, address that prior to town meeting, it would be great. Well, I think we should. I mean, I think just for the articles vote, if we need to do a lot of positive press of, hey, we have some, in we can have some input here, and this is our time to do it. That's that's what's encouraging mm -hmm. me to me about it. All right. So I guess. A key point, and, and Bill cleared it up in an email that I sent to him, is um, the articles of agreement that are coming from the potential transition board, uh, we can fix or at least make more palatable the default articles, which, which are, are less than palatable, I think. <laughs> so we can... Uh, write in some things that uh, are absent in the default articles or, uh, or write in some things that uh, we'd like to change from the default articles. So my understanding is it's either our default articles, which might be a little better, but don't fix the key problems of Act 46 in some people's opinion, right. but uh, they are better than, they're the lesser of two evils. I guess. Yes, there's opportunity. And again, that's my opinion. I'm editorializing yep. there, but yep. the the default articles are the the more evil of two evils, and, <laughs> and what we can do uh, as a WCSU community is is uh, try to yeah soften the blow, yep. soften the landing. That. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Vera mentioned some kind of informational uh, output from from the board to the taxpayers. Uh, and it may have been primarily uh, budget, but you know, obviously the budget is impacted by the new structure as well. So if we a, there is a lot of explaining to do to let people yeah. know that what, you know, why is the school budget not there on town meeting day? Yeah. Why There's are we electing right multiple boards? Right. Yep. Uh, oh, that was the other thing. Sorry, I forgot something. Keep, keep yeah. So it, I, I guess I'd want to know to what extent, you know, Bill, you would, you're going to plan to continue to put out the kind of the general I think I think it, I mean it's like I said when we were trying the budget process of all years not to be communicating this is the one yeah. and I'm planning to use videos because it's actually faster for me to produce a video mm -hmm. 
with either with slides or not, or just me talking. Okay. Um, and the, use them as we the, want. And then and to put them up and say, here they are, and people want to go look at them, okay. instead of having to write a whole formal piece. Yeah. And I also, I mean, um, you know, I think there's many times for us to communicate about this, and I think, you know, Chris, you, you helped me relearn this through the bond project. The more you communicate, even though it's a similar message, the more likelihood that someone's going to hear it, yeah, you know? And so, um, you know, I'm looking at town reports right now, and that's what I forgot to talk to you about. So we can talk about that somewhere Something here. In the town Before we get done with the discussion, I want to talk to you about town yeah. report. Yeah. So I'm hearing the message that more communication, <laughs> the better. Um, and I'll, I'll be glad to try to do that on front porch forum. Yeah. Generally have, and maybe through news to know through Corinne. I think any means is worth, worth attempting. Yeah. Yeah. And town report would be another good place to put a yep. summary in there. Yep. School, yeah, why don't we report. finish with a 46 and I'll go back. That was supposed okay. to be part of that future okay. meeting. report. Yep. Um, so I will just report real quick on the articles committee. It's not under here, but it, you know that is a part of Act 46. We, we worked for I don't know, a good half a day on, uh, I guess it was last Friday, and, and several meetings before that. And I totally agree with what Carl said. It's just an opportunity to massage some of these articles and make them a little little more palatable rather than the default article but um, you know of course there's nothing we've been told over and over again nothing we can do on the on the shared debt piece of it to to change that in any way um, so that's frustrating but it is what it is um, we had a lot of interest real good discussions difficult discussions about uh, certain articles um, there were a number of them where you know we thought the default worked as best as, as we could do it. Um, so we went with the default articles, but you'll see those recommendations coming out to the transition board, and I agree that's a place for to try to get a lot of community input participation on those draft articles before they go out for a vote. Something, <laughs> our actually Berlin Mall presentation made you think of a potential article to suggest uh, that uh, any re revenue from land sale by the consolidated consolidated board will be given back to the town uh, where the land is located in the future. I think that's one of the things, I think it's a concern Vera has, and yeah. although for Berlin specifically, I don't think it matters as much because we are an island, we are isolated from the rest of the district, mm -hmm. short of building a centralized elementary school at the U32 campus and closing the other five which won't happen. That won't happen. Uh, um, <laughs> Berlin will remain a school, but I know there was some concern about the property value of Berlin Elementary School, and, and if that were to ever be sold for any reason, that the land was donated to the town of Berlin for the purpose of uh, using as an educational institution and uh, um, by a family, uh, from what I understand, too. So. Um, I think that would be a hedge against uh, against you know taking that will of that family from the town, and also in the case of the Berlin Mall, if we happen to sell a portion of that land, that would offset some of the uh, um, costs that Berlin will incur from the cons forced consolidation. Yeah, I think your point about the land for this, this school having been donated is, 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 is important. I mean, that, uh, at the time that the Berlin board um, leased the land to the fire department, um, there was an offer to build the town of Berlin a new school on a separate piece of property and hand us the key in, in exchange for this piece of property in this building. So the reality is that that might still be a possibility. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a reality that I would recommend or be very comfortable with. Um, but as part of my charge, I have been checking, trying to determine the value of this facility. Um, got some feedback from the uh, 
board of listeners over the weekend and have and requested that they uh, attempt to give us a more current value because the existing value is uh, 2008 has been reappraised since 2008. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and it won't help us if we are talking about a, a piece of an edge of the property from the Berlin Mall or anything like that. That, that and that's a whole different conversation. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that the, that the property is very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless, I mean, it's a valuable as it is, too. The, the, the fact of the matter is that the Pike family gave the town the land for the old school across the road and the old fire department that was across the road and this facility. So they've done a lot. Thank you, Pike family. <laughs> yes, yes. Again. <laughs> so, Bill, do you um, have some information for us under 3.3.2? Um, I, I did a couple months ago, and I haven't looked at it since you and I talked, Chris. Um, I, look, I talked with John Pandolfo and Barry when they went to Trent to have the, the Barry Wreckfields uh, transferred from the school to the town, and it's something that took them about three years to do. They just didn't do it this year. They had been working on it for a while to transfer all that land to Barry, to the Barry Town municipality from the mm -hmm. school. So he said once working, he works with the same attorneys we do, and that getting through all the surveying and all the deed searching and all that, I don't think it would take three years. That seems a little long. But, and he said that was, some of that was due to actions that the select board needed to take for Barry Town that took a while to get done. Mm -hmm. And so, when you have two municipalities, school district and a municipality working together, sometimes things get a little delayed. Okay. I, I just don't think we could do it between now and June 30th. Is, no. If, if it involves a subdivision. If we'd have to do subdivision hearings. I don't know what the actual acreage yeah. is for hearings. Where well, there's different acreages for different things you have to yeah. do, and we'd have to get um, surveying done and all that. Is it is the process under Act 46 for the transfer to happen on July 1st? Yep. I mean that's a legal process. And Th that's on my to do. That for this week is to call Scott Cameron, and he has a partner who's a real estate attorney, and say, "Tell me what we what we got to get done between that's, now." Uh, Probably different than it's definitely not a subdivision of no, the property. It's a transfer of ownership. It's a, it's a difference. It's a transfer of ownership between this this school district to the new school district, and doesn't involve the town. I believe it doesn't belong to the town because the school district owns. Uh, from looking at the deeds that were sent when we did this evaluation, I asked the deeds mm -hmm. to be sent. The school district owns all the land mm -hmm. here. So, so you're saying it would not require a subdivision? No, it would if we were going to like have the playing have fields and have those owned by the that's, town and the school. The question I'd ask the bill was, you know, it, if there were, if we were to consider maybe transferring any piece of this property to the town mm -hmm. before it becomes property of the larger district, um, what does that process involve, and you know, what timeline are we looking at? And we're, it, it's complicated because you're involving a, probably a, a vote of this board and then a vote of the select Absolutely. board and a vote of the town um, and then the subdivision and mm -hmm. surveying and all that um, but I just wanted to have that information to understand what what that looks like I know other other towns are looking at that and considering yep. that yep. right now I still um, have a hard time believing that uh, no local authority has to sign or, or no. So when Act 60 was when Act 60 was ruled, and the Act 60 that came from the Supreme Court says that the state has the legal authority over all of education in the state of Vermont. Education. Education. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's educational property too. Uh, yeah, that's education. That's part of the education. I think that'll be part of the lawsuit. I'm sure. As well. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 And I think that's the winnable part of it. Yeah. Now, we're talking right now about subdivision, subdividing, potential subdividing portions of this property for one reason or another. Um, one of the options 
put on the table by the but the uh, debt committee was for the town to for the school to turn over ownership to the town. Yeah. Now I heard you say, Carl, that none of those those options are possible. Is that without current without legislation? They all change. require legislation, legislation change. right? And they have varying degrees of promise. I yeah, guess. I think so. Or yeah, I think that's what it was thought. But they would all any alternative to the default would require um, something to be signed, sealed, and delivered by July first. I I don't know. Um, I really don't know because of um, my mind struck between practical, mm -hmm. be able to get things done, and actually, when is it? You know, when I think the legislature can do can enact new laws right up until they end the session or recess the session in this case because it's a biennium. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think. Uh, from a practical standpoint, any subdivision is is problematic before July first. I mean, I think it would be amazing to have anything other than the simplest subdivision. Maybe a, maybe a strip to the mall, maybe under ten acres, uh, which I think would be the threshold. I think you're right. And, and uh, you know, that would be as simple as any of the other possibilities, I guess. So, you know, that could happen, I guess. Uh, so at, our, at our last meeting, I asked this board if, if we should explore it, if it's a possibility that we ought to, we ought to look at. Um, I'm, I have a hard time thinking of what pieces you would carve out for the town or, or what we tend to, would stand to gain from it. It's pretty clear, you know, in the Barry town elementary school there's a lot of really very public use mm -hmm. all the fields and there's tennis the bike and, and the bike rack the bike path the and path all that. up there and all that I think that made sense for them I don't know that it necessarily makes sense here and then when we you know hearing what the mall developers are looking at um, I think the only I don't think there's a uh, there's not a lot of value to that frontage back to the wetlands so um, you know that'll just be a probably a like like trade and you know, maybe they deed us another little piece of property or something like that and that's just going to go to the benefit of the school regardless of whether that's a Berlin board the, decision the, or a district decision. Yeah, the intent of that option of town selling, school district selling land and buildings to the town, I'm not sure if selling is even the right word, but transferring. Um, was to ensure that the assets of each town stayed within the town, um, the assets that were being paid for by the voters of each town. Um, so everything would belong to the town as opposed to the school district, the elementary school district, and there would be some hardly convoluted equation to figure an annual payment lease a lease payment, lease payment. Mm -hmm. um, to to um, I guess from from the state uh, taxes is a combination of taxes well no it'd be money from the state but part of it would go to the town for the for the uh, bricks and mortar and I'm not sure that I, I think that's probably one of the less viable of the five options Mm -hmm. They're all pretty complicated. Do you want to transition into that since we're on the well, subject? Well, I guess we're sort of doing that, yeah. 3.4, I mean, the debt committee recommendation. I could summarize to say that, uh, uh, that the debt committee had no consensus, no uh, consensus of agreement on any one of those articles, any one of those proposals to recommend. Um, and I think it's fair to say that they were all attempts to, um, if not equalize, then minimize the impacts on, on towns that did not have high debt. Um, and 
as we know now, uh, all of them would require uh, legislation to, to, to allow them to go forward. And even at that, then, then there would be a lot of um, work to come up with a, an equation to make them, to make them uh, accomplish what, what the wording uh, is looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would, at this stage, I would be, I think we would be looking for guidance from the Articles Committee, would we not? to whether or not to pursue any of those, and, and, and if so, how? Well, the Articles Committee talked on Friday and said, you know, we're with, as written, until something changes in the, in the statute. Right. As written? By the new draft articles of we consolidate draft. all assets and yeah. liabilities. There was, there was some discussion of the, trying to write in an alternative, alternative path mm -hmm. in the article if the law changes, which is kind of... In other words, if there's legislative... If there's legislative action. Legislative action yeah. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. Then it, it basically, uh, if and when there is any legislative action, that might determine if, we, if there's anything can be done, and if so, what? I've had some contact with um, legislative representatives, and uh, that's the, the place there action doesn't seem to have a good a good plan or any method of attack to fix that problem the debt issue mm -hmm. uh, there are other issues that they might be looking at trying to rectify but mm -hmm. i don't think they have a solution for that especially yeah, since some communities have already uh, mm -hmm. been struck with with the burden of higher spending districts or yeah. or other districts debt so I suspect that's a big roadblock yep so there were there are five recommendations here and did you have any comment on I mean they all require no. legislative change no, I really <laughs> don't I mean they're they're uh, they're the worst and the worst and the <laughs> most worst there we go. Uh, of five options a the uh, are a, a, an attempt by representatives from the five towns to come up with some kind of means to uh, to equity, and and uh, and they're all very convoluted, and they all require legislative action, which we know is uh, a slim possibility. You know, it's what's uh, a solution. It it wouldn't really require. Uh, anything to do with education law is that uh, we will clearly see what each former district saved or paid and uh, an agreement to make a ballot measure for say let's say Middlesex you said saves four cents on their tax rate the following year to say does the town of Middlesex approve redistributing the redistributed debt from 2018 to to the other communities I wonder how many people would vote yes on that <laughs> right. in, in a community that was uh, saving a lot because of act 46 debt or rep or spending redistribution it would be mm -hmm. interesting to see anything else on the on the debt committee I don't think so yeah, is that right we skipped over 3.3.3 .3 transition board membership. We may have covered this a little bit already, Bill. Um, Is the chair and the clerk automatically? You may elect someone else if you, the board so choose. They did change that at the last minute on the draft articles. Okay. Sorry, I'm just where that came from. I'm all, I'm confused by a lot of this, but. Because we were told, we were told at first it was chair and clerk and it did, but then some some folks went back in between to the state board. So they were first presented to the state board back in October, and then in the November second of the three meetings in November, 
they the state boards said you know there are some, and I know Donna had received some of this information that yeah. there are some people who were saying we're just not going to do it, or yeah. there are and some people who said that the the clerk has resigned from the board altogether that not correct, because yeah. of Act Forty Six. So how do we? And we were one of the ones that sent that in. And so what's the process? Because at first it said you had to be the clerk of the chair as of July 1st, right. 2018. <laughs> and was that the draft article? Was that that was the law? draft. That was the draft, the draft article. article. And then what they, they reapportioned that the boards could elect to have someone okay. else there. All right. And that came in literally on November 28th. Okay. So under our action agenda, it's appoint members to the transition. That's right. That's what we asked to do. That that was a recommendation that we thought was good to get to everybody. Yeah. So we were just clear if anyone was switching roles. Okay. Thanks. Anything else from Act Forty Six we're missing here? I think you're you're on it as to what today we know today. Yeah. It's a moving target. And did you hear in your debt committee discussions, Peter, any, you get any indication as to what board, maybe boards are not discussing this in that setting, but what boards are doing with their capital funds? No, although that was discussed and um, um, that was also addressed in a couple of the article uh, proposals um, as a way of tempering yeah. the inequity yeah. um, uh, but uh, I, I don't think there's anything that I could quote there was conversation about well we should spend it or we should get rid of it before the end of the school year and I will tell you that at your different fellow boards there have been some conversation about spending or not um, yeah I'm going to suggest you when we get to the 3.4 that you do a transfer uh, I'm hoping that the I'm going to be recommending to the transition board and to the new board that the monies that come in under capital plans be allocated to those schools to be used for repair with capital expenses at those schools. Stay at those schools. They stay at those schools, basically. You know, we need a new driveway out here, and putting that that what we're over the four percent right now could really help us get to the place where we might be able to get a new driveway pretty soon with where we're landing. So let's move to 3.4 then in capital fund. So if I have you, can I have you go to page 24? And you, you've all known this for a while, that, you know, with our 4% es estimate for where the fund, the current year fund balance to target should be, that's 140,000, that with 248,000, almost 249,000 um, in, in reserved right now, uh, that I would recommend that a hundred and somewhere between a hundred and five and a hundred and ten thousand dollars of that you move to your capital fund, and I am really thinking about that driveway out there. Um, you know, Chris, when you and I looked at it two years ago, we were looking at a two hundred thousand dollar price tag for that, um, and it would be something nice. To, I think all our car suspensions would like it if we got that mm -hmm. fixed. Wouldn't that money go into just a big pot, though, and then it come, becomes the new the new consolidated boards? It could. That's why I'm saying. I, that's why I was deliberate about what I just said, Carl. Is I'm recommending all of it does, and recommending that the board say, "Hey, can we take what was in the capital fan plans and say that that's for Berlin Elementary School came in with that amount of money in their capital plan? Let's use it for Berlin Elementary School capital projects." So that's an act of, of faith in a yeah. way, and I, yeah. I trust that that would probably happen. But is there a way for us to be a little more sure about that and maybe commit well, some of the funds? To well, the driveway or if you committed them now, we couldn't pull it off. And one of the things I'm trying to look into right now is, um, I was in this discussion because U32 is putting a new track in place, yeah. and Romney's going to put is going out with an RFP for a boiler. So. Um, if we do this today, if we got committals for today, can this board make commitments past June 30th? There is a part in the law that talks about honoring all existing contracts, whether it be a personnel contract like my contract or a contract you have with a provider or someone to do something. So I, I have that on a list for Scott Cameron, our attorney, to talk to about and say, hey, Scott. Um, 
But I, I think for me, everyone's coming in with some pretty good capital budgets. Mm -hmm. And I think and I think it's pretty proportional. The one that's outside the proportion is East Montpelier. East Montpelier. They've been putting away for every year since they've done that, and they've grown a pretty sizable capital fund balance. Um, but they know that the way anything does after renovation, you build up that capital fund because your life cycles for things in the building tend to be 15, 20 years, and then they start failing. So um, we also know we didn't get everything done in this renovation that we wanted to get done. We got more than we thought because we were able to get that roof in. Right. So I, I have nothing more than your faith to come down to the bottom line, but I think people are going to be like, hey, we did this for our building. Yeah. Well, East Montpelier has over half a million dollars. In oh, it's close to, it's between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars if I'm remembering correctly. I could be wrong. I should always not quote numbers without them in front of me. Well, that certainly was a sore point with them thinking that that would be folded into or thrown in the pot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over. But uh, I think a recommendation from you uh, uh, when that discussion comes up that funds raised in the town for purposes in the in each school be, remain there. I think that would be. I think that would be palatable to a lot of people, including the voters, who you know paid the taxes to put that fund together. I'm not sure. It's going to be really interesting discussions when, you know, East, when Callis or, or Worcester need an improvement and they're saying that they're shouldering our debt, mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be able to take some of our capital fund to do their improvements. Absolutely. Fair, fair argument. argument. Very fair argument. They're concerned about that and they're concerned about losing their schools, um, which is. I think legitimate. But. One of the reasons why I want a capital committee. Hmm. Yeah. I'm being really open and honest. I want those discussions with board members. Yeah. This is this is not encouraging good behavior on our part. I'm, I'm feeling like we should spend it. So you're not the only, almost every other board has felt that way. And yeah. I said, guys, if you spent everything that was in, not only your capital funds, but in your, because some people talk to do about doing that with fund balance. And I said, Hold on, we don't know. The reason we have the fund balances is because we have to have cash in the bank account. And mm -hmm. yeah, um, I'm not saying spend all of it. Yeah, no, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. But I also don't want to do projects quickly and not have them done yeah. right. I understand that too. Because I mean, you know, Chris as well as anyone, if we're going to do a driveway, we better start getting some drawings going. Yeah. What. I heard Chris say was it doesn't encourage good behavior. <laughs> I understand that. He's right. I understand that. I encourage him to not have the only ones good behavior. That discussion, right? And and I guess what we what we rely on, Bill, is for you to have that discussion with everyone, so that we don't have some outlier that. That's I'm trying to that. have it with everyone. <laughs> I'm trying. Yep. And then you know when the consolidation happens, uh, and. Worcester needs a new roof. Hopefully, the new board would recognize that and, and out of the pot, pay for a new roof. Just like I hope they would understand that we need support for math yeah. and, 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 and early ed yeah. in our yeah. pre K and say, yeah, that's legitimate. But we'll, we're not going to know that for. So that's my capital. Okay. And I, if it is so, I would put it on your next agenda to move it over if you'd like me to for an action agenda item. I thought I'd bring it to you as a discussion. So, please. what exactly are the options? Uh, that we can. You can leave it in the general fund balance. You can put it over to the capital fund. Um, I'm encouraging you to put it in the capital fund because that's had a meeting that the voters approved that fund created in 2010 for capital work here. And that helps. There is a piece in Act 46 about approved funds and keeping those uses as merging. I, wanna, I don't have the exact language, so I'm not going to say that I know it exactly how that works, 
um, but I, I frankly haven't gotten to that part of my checklist yet of things to do. But it more clearly defines what those funds are for. That's right. And which I, makes a subsequent discussion a little bit easier, maybe. Yeah. Every town has an approved capital fund. Yeah. By the voters. And that um, the but the proposed budget that we saw assumes that transfer stays in the fifty thousand dollars transfer that we had this year stays in. So I guess one choice we could have we have is to use it to offset the, the increased spending or the yeah. intervention. But that's a one year, and that's right. the double hole that Bill was right. talking about is you know putting money into the capital fund, which I would maybe perhaps recklessly consider since it's all going into one pot. Don't blame me. Blame the author of Act 46. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody wants to take responsibility for that. <laughs> no, we don't need to blame each other. I mean, we certainly don't need to blame, I mean, we need to try not to blame the other schools in our district and have mm -hmm. a balanced discussion based on an act that we're all stuck with. Right? I mean, over the uh, last few years, you got to really know the issues of the other towns and the other districts and and the policies that they followed, uh, fiscal responsibility, the choices, the tough choices they made. And mm -hmm. I can appreciate looking at towns like Callis who were, you know, very careful and had a long-term capital plan and, and uh, you know, they, they did a great job. And they did. They're now potentially being penalized for that. And East Montpelier, I appreciate the fact that their community values education and doesn't mind spending a lot more. That was um, their decision. That was their decision. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, that's their community decision. I, I, I respect that. Uh, I find it tough that, you know, an injustice maybe that Callis is really being penalized and East Montpelier is perhaps even being rewarded for, for that, uh, mm -hmm. the choices Speaking. their community made. but. If Callis wants to take some of their capital fund, I would not think less of them. Right. If uh, they're yeah. spending some right now on a new septic system. Yeah. Good. It's hard to argue with that. Yep. Yeah. They have to, because <laughs> right. they can't keep it running. So I'd just ask you, I think, to, uh, Bill, I guess, put put on the capital fund. As the transfer, transfer or for, on action. For next, okay. for, action yep. for next meeting, but to ask in the meantime for. Um, us to think long and hard about um, what we want to do with our capital fund balance. And I, by then, I even if I'm not here, I can pass along the information I get from Scott on about entering into contracts yeah. and all that. I will ask the contract question. And that would be the one, the the, the biggest capital improvement that we have on our list. Yeah, and the money. I mean, you're going to be at three hundred thousand, and if we can do it for under two, so we keep it somewhat, we're not empty. You know, using I think going less than two thirds of it's not a smart idea, but I think we're in that we're at that point where we might be able to say, and that was some of our conversation, and you'll be putting another fifty into it. So I think it'd be a tough sell, I, and I, I could be wrong, but Romney, Doty, and Callis have. Mud parking lots, I think, or I don't think they have paving at all. So I think I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. There's some pavement. A little bit. At no, those are all walkways. Sorry. Yeah. So that might be a tough sell uh, to <laughs> communities that don't have any paving to make ours better. Too, so. All right. Everything's a tough. You, I think uh, your your board members are going to be salespeople that we want to elect for the consolidated board. Right, yeah, you're right. True silver tongue salespeople <laughs> politicians. I think are <laughs> some interesting discussions. Yeah. yeah, there will be more lobbying happening. Well, the importance of that. I was thinking. I bet the the um, consolidated board could meet weekly and still not have time to do all they need to do properly. There's been talk about having. Uh, consultants, uh, you know, people who are willing to help out, people who used to be board members who could be called upon to yeah. do homework, I guess, basically, yeah. which would be one way to address all that work that's got to be done by so many fewer people. All right. Uh, we covered 3.5 already, mall property update, 4.0 reports to the board. Um, Bill, any of those you want to? 
I, there's, I would take any questions. There's my report. There's the director's report in there. I don't think there's a report from Aaron. I do not believe I flew, flew through it. Um, and uh, I think you know uh, there was a great bingo session here for mm -hmm. Eric and his family, for yeah. his daughter. It was and, great, great success. I um, wasn't able to come, but I heard it was really Yeah, good. and Aaron was here and he told me it was fabulous. There were a lot of people that weren't necessarily that he didn't recognize from being school parents or school community. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in that transition right now between Thanksgiving and Christmas and time period. And uh, uh, the kids are, I haven't been in this building this week. I was in it last week and the kids were doing great when I walked around, so. And I just kind of gave you the finance report unless there's any questions, but. No. I don't really have much uh, from the executive committee. There's the, the minutes are on page 27. Um, can you think of anything from there, Bill, with this? We talked We ordinance? talked a lot about it last week at the, at the supervisory union meeting on yep. December, so that, that covered most of it. Yep. Uh, policy committee. There was no quorum at the last meeting. Oh, yeah. Sorry, that's I right. was. School quality kind of reported at the SU. Is the school quality, um, it's the school quality committee that reported at the SU that you know, those are the, um, the educational goals that we're looking at under our action agenda? That's correct. Okay. And their minutes are on page 34 and 35. And is there anything from negotiations to update us on that? We've met twice. We've worked on, uh, on, um, I can't remember if I can tell you the topic. That's what I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, but we've met <coughs> twice. We're soon to get into healthcare and salary. We were working on. I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on it, Chris. Too many things. Vera's been there. She's been okay. very helpful. All right, are we ready to move on to the action agenda? 5.1, appoint board member. We don't have one, so we'll move on to 5.2, accept the audit report. Anything you want to tell us about this, Bill? We got it by email. You sent it to you by email, so we just got them, and I really wanted to get them done here in, uh, in December for the town report, and uh, there weren't any findings or recommendations. I think that was true across the board. There were a couple items of note for changing a few of our little procedures in house, which we're doing already, or have done. I should say, no, you all know the effectiveness of Lori Bebo, so. And so we need a motion to accept the audit report. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? We have accepted the audit report. 5.3 is recommend approving the school quality committee recommendations for SU wide goal related to student learning to the transition board. Can you give us a little bit more background on, the, on that bill? There was a lot discussed at the SU board. Right. Matthew um, thought it would, and it was adopted by the SU, and someone recommended would it be better, would it be just as good to have the local boards adopt these all goals? The local boards adopt it. And, and so this was the, this was, this was bowing, this was agreeing with that, saying let's put it on, so I just put it, had it put on all the agendas, okay. saying, you know, the goal that we had that uh, we would go from 70, 45 to 71 percent of our students proficient as measured by STAR 360 in mathematics by the end of the school year. And I forget exactly what it was for Berlin without playing my laptop. We were all there at the SU board meeting <laughs> for that presentation. And those were left very broad. Yeah. yeah. And asking, it was asking, you know, some of the recommendations were asked for us to come back with a literacy goal here in January yep. mm -hmm. and to come back after reflect and to ask for a reflection of all the instructors of math and literacy at the end of the year, how to go working with the goals, and then how does that inform where we would look for a three year goal, a goal three years out? 
want to say I shouldn't bring up a problem without a solution, but uh, <laughs> one of the issues that I always have with that is looking at uh, the, a school as a collective. So you have, we were at 40% uh, proficiency, and mm -hmm. rather than looking at the kids as individuals and uh, reaching their maximum potential, and I've said that a lot, but, uh, uh, you know, if you took East Montpelier as 40% proficient, Berlin's 40% pr proficient, and you put those 40% together, regardless of the uh, educational quality, you would still probably have, you know, 60 to 85 percent proficiency there. So I feel like it's very difficult to put on the schools all the responsibility for those who have not reached proficiency, just as it's difficult to say that the schools are responsible for all proficiency. But that's what we do, and I, I can't, I mean, I, here's where I don't have a solution. I mean, how do you measure the quality uh, by the collective by a proficiency rating because in, in reality uh, there are a lot of factors besides the educational quality that lead kids to proficiency and you've talked about. This is where you and I have said before we're in different places, right. Carl. You think everybody can get to proficiency. I've seen and, it. And I, I, I've seen yeah. it get, get, almost, get almost there. If that's, I mean, if that's the case, then if we are at 40%, then everybody should be fired. Because if it, if it can be attained and it's and we're only at forty percent, you then said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just, I guess my problem is the the collective evaluation and not treating kids as individual. Looking at that stat, I don't have so, a better so, solution. So, so I want you, in all seriousness, what I want you to understand, we do look at kids individually. We can't say that in a public meeting. We can't tell you what we're doing individually for Chris and for Peter and for you. Right. We do have to talk, and that's our, uh, at this level, for the school or for the SU to look at it as a collective. Mm -hmm. And we do do that work. That is happening. I've, I've observed, I've been in three faculty meetings in the past nine days where I've observed teachers doing that with that data. Mm -hmm. What's it take for Peter? What do we need to do for Peter to help him be more fresh? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's different, and it should be. That's, that's my seriousness of the whole conversation. That said, Carl, are you comfortable approving these yes. goals broadly? Yep, because then I don't think there's a solution. <laughs> yeah. So I entertain a motion to that effect. So moved if you ask for a motion or? Do you have the motion? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The wording from 5.3? Wording from 5.3. Second. Okay, is there any further discussion on that? Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. And the ayes have it. Uh, 5.4 is to appoint a, represent, is it rep a representative yep. to the Articles of Agreement Committee, which is... You currently. Or has been you and up to the SU board. So there hasn't been an official... There uh, was what... You mean I didn't have to go to those meetings? <laughs> <laughs> so Matthew feels and um, that... That board should re that there was an ending of date of December third, and Being that the charge. local boards should reappoint oh. okay. the representative to that, and reappoint recommend a membership person for the Act Forty Nine. You see that down at five six. That's They're almost six, the same yeah. thing, but one <clears throat> is going to sunset probably here in December, yep. and then the trend there'll be an Act Forty Nine like board to put together the rest of the articles. Okay. Yeah, there's only a little, I think, only right. a little bit more work left. With right. This I think you. I think you're almost done. Group to do. So you were the member, and I suggested in the SU meeting that you keep the composition the same as six, because it says, like a 706B committee, not exactly. Okay. And I think, from what I've observed, having six people at the table, we get things done. All right. So I am willing to continue serving if. On that basis, I move that we reappoint Chris. Second. <laughs> you can't back out. Any discussion? Wait a minute. <laughs> They're being done. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 All right. So Chris Winters is appointed as the representative to the Articles of Agreement Committee. Thank you. Oh, sure. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, 
appoint members to the transition board. So, so that's not automatically the chair and the clerk. We, so I look, I, this is the way I look at it. If no one is appointed by the board, the clear and the, ch the chair. chair and the clerk, the, the, the okay. chair and the clerk would be it. I think it allows people if they want to switch around. So we've put this on all the local board agendas. There's three or four right. items here we've put on all the local board right. agendas mm -hmm. for this month. And again, I was saying I'm willing to serve. Last I spoke to Vera, she was willing to serve. I think that would be really appropriate. I mean, if there's any way both of you can see your way to doing that. And, and on that basis, I would move that Chris and Vera be appointed. Is that what we're doing? As members to the transition board. Appointed. All yeah. right. Is there a second? As second? Everyone's members mm -hmm. to the transition board. Okay. It was made and seconded. Any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. We've appointed members to the transition board. And 5.6 is to recommend membership for an Act 49 committee. So this is the continuation of work on the articles. Yep. After the transition board. No. It's really, it's really, it's going to be that week of January where we have the hearing and because we have to have a one for Act 49 okay. group. So here's where I am willing to serve, but I'm also willing to step aside if anyone else has a real interest in uh, being a part of that committee. And that's when this articles committee steps aside and a new committee is formed to work on articles on behalf of the transition board. No. So you I get, are I, up I, to speed. I am willing to continue that willing to continue work, it. sure. I would move that we Recommend. Recommend. Chris Winters as Irwin's representative to the transition board. To Act, the Act 49. Act 49 committee. Yep. Excuse me, Act 49 committee. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Chris, I know we're getting late, but I didn't get a chance to talk to you about town report and you finished your action. Oh, sure. I just wonder if I can just take two yep. minutes. Let's do that. I just wanted to inform you. Um, I've been in this again conversations with the uh, uh, town clerks. We're getting ready. We usually do our town report, uh, and, you know, for the it goes into the town report. I am coming with a recommendation to you as a board, and I'd like some feedback that what goes in the town report is what reports about this current school year or the year before, as in the audit. And that because it'll need to be a new town report for the budget for FY20 that would come with the merged from the merged board because they're the ones that will be recommending to the electorate the new merged budget. So therefore things that are in the town report that would continue are like the board, the chair's report, my report, the principal's report, the list of school salaries, um, the U32 salaries, the independent audit report and the audit itself. Um, and there's usually a special ed child fine notice or something like that. But the rest are all things that have to do with the budget, as in what's the budget, what's the tax rate, how does U32 come into that, all that. As I look down, this is the list. I only brought one copy, but you can see where I circled and where I haven't circled of all the items that we usually get into the report. So you're saying with absolute certainty that there will not be a Berlin Elementary School budget on town meeting day? That, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying in the town report we wouldn't do that. I'm not saying that yet. What I'm saying is in the town report we would not have a Berlin Elementary School budget. Because we won't have one available in time. We have one available. You just told me what the budget is. Well, essentially, yeah. But, you know, we were going into a merge budget. The merge budget will get presented. So should there be any contingency planning? That's what I was that, asking. That maybe, that <laughs> maybe there's a... Berlin budget to vote on town meeting. What if there is a Berlin budget to be which, voted on? Which would mean there was a stay mm -hmm. or very early legislative action. These are all, you know, probably pretty So, slim so we need to know but. by the town to get ballots done? Yep. It's January 28th. Right. So we can say that the budget that we essentially finalized tonight would be available to be given to the town clerk 
by mid-January. But if, not that, that might be the only thing, because here's I just got to give you a dose of reality in our office. Lori's like, I'm doing this once. I don't have time to do it twice mm -hmm. because she's having to implement new fiscal software right now that's mandated through mm -hmm. state law last year. Mm -hmm. So she's having to build a whole new software system right now. So literally today, she's like, what am I doing now? We're literally in checklist modes but right she's, now. She's building the six budgets, right, separately? That's that's easy, Chris. It's doing all the stuff to get to town report. Get it to the town report. To get it to the town report and build all the different tax rates and do it six, you know, do it two different ways. And so, yeah. But to follow up on that, if, if she, she, you, we are building six different budgets, have you had this question come up? This is the first, you're the first board I've brought this question to. Okay. I'm gonna bring it to all of them to say, folks, to do this twice, if we get a stay, I think I'm gonna be recommending you to find a special meeting for a budget meeting, for a budget vote. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to hit town meeting because we're stopping everything we usually do. Right now, we're in high production yeah. because we usually have to hit the 10th of January with everything ready to go. Mm -hmm. We check it again, and it goes out Martin Luther King Day. Yeah. Yeah, now that I think about that, even if we did get a stay, it probably wouldn't hit town meeting day, the budget vote, mm -hmm. just because we're not prepared for it. Not necessarily we're not prepared for it, but the, the work that Lori would have. Yeah, I mean, right now we're literally building the, the financial terms. system, and we have to build it in two different pieces of software because we don't know the state software is going to be up and running, even though they tell us yeah. it will be. Yeah. We have to build in our old <laughs> in our old system and the new system. So, I mean, the financial department right now is humming with a lot of work. So the state mandates that you use the new system, Gen but there's July one. Theirs is not ready for to be used. That's right. <laughs> well, you can thank the, the Senate for that. That came from the Senate Chair of Education. Uh, yeah, it just it just that boggles my mind over and over again. So I don't know about the two of you, but I guess I'm comfortable not sending Berlin specific bu budget information in for the town town report. But still doing what you're suggesting. Yeah, you know, I, and I, I, I want to. I mean, I think a lot of my report, and I'm hoping some of yours will be too, Chris. About this is the changes that we're in. Right. We're in the midst of doing right now. You know, we it's a non-voluntary merger, so we've got things we've got to do. But we want to keep you up to date on timeline. Blah blah blah. That's just where the multiple messages, and that's when you said that. I was like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be talking about the, the town report too. Well, when are we going to have an opportunity to tell the voters how responsible we were here tonight to not <laughs> vote all the things we thought were appropriate? Well, if they're not going to see it, we probably should have. Right? <laughs> well, <laughs> that thought occurred to me also. <laughs> so thank you for indulging me for five minutes. That makes sense. Thank you. I, I just, I really want to have these conversations with all of you. All right. So back down to approved board orders. Yep. yep. So that's that's I'm going to give you the amount. I had it open, then I closed it. It is twenty six thousand three hundred sixty six and seventy five cents. Got it, Tiffany. Yep. Thanks. I make a motion to approve the board orders in the amount of twenty six three sixty six seventy five. Second. Second. And any further discussion? Those in favor, say aye. All right. As opposed, no. And the ayes have it. And the board orders are approved. Any future agenda items? I have a couple of reports I need to get to you, which is the item for the action item for the capital plan, uh, information about entering new contracts. Um, and uh, I think that was it. I wrote some other things that I want to investigate and talk with you. Would, uh, would a bond be a, considered a new contract or because we're a... Laurie's looking into how we have to restructure things and how we do that with the bonds right now. I don't have an answer for you. You mean existing bonds or a new bond? Our existing bonds. We're, we're Berlin School District. Right. But we're going to become yeah. a new yeah. school district. So. That's a question that that uh, the, the deck committee discussed and Lori's investigated and you know there are different one of those proposals addressed 
the, the different values of existing bonds within, from school to school, the different ages of the of the bonds, therefore the different the different uh, payoff years, um, and you know the impacts based on the size of those uh, bonds right. to a to a to a district. And part of the part of the difficulty with that that proposal was that it our bond actually is the oldest. It's not the largest by any means, but it goes out to 2037, which adds another dimension to any solution equation that you can come up with. Huh. At different interest rates too. Uh, I mean. Right. Well, I think that's the biggest issue probably is if uh, negotiations are reopened, what happens to the interest rates? Mm -hmm. Those vary from bond to bond, and and uh, they're higher now than they were mm -hmm. for any of the, any of the bonds. I think. Hmm. Oh, that's all very tricky. Um, anything else to go on to the future agenda items? We will, of course, have an Act 46 section and a board member vacancy section. I'll, I'll try to advertise for that again, see if we can, and if you, can, you all can think about uh, who might be interested. Um, I'd also ask you to think about who might be interested in serving on the new board, because that's end of January that they have to yep. have their yep. petitions in. Either of our U32 reps should probably be in that conversation too. Or I, think, yeah. I think Jonathan Goddard is probably the most experienced board member. We, well, Vera and Jonathan Goddard, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? No. Is there a motion to adjourn? Or we can adjourn by consensus. 807.